Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second Witcher Book Club episode. In this episode, we're talking about Sword of Destiny. Yay! By Andre Sapkowski. I've seen some people, they pronounce the W with a V, so it's Sapkowski <laughs> now, Ross. So I think as these books go Is that on, okay? As these books go on, we're going to become more and more confident in all of our pronunci- pronunciations of things, I think. <laughs> Well, speaking of, of confident, I, I, I mean, first thing out of the gate, we just have to mention your complete and total vindication of uh, your pronunciation <laughs> of the name Dandelion. I mean, to, when I when I listen to the first uh, few seconds of the book or, you know, when you first came up, I was like, this, this is amazing. I was rooting for you. Last time that this was the way it was going to be pronounced, and then it totally was, and I was like, Jason called it. That was crazy. The one thing, the one question I have on Peter Kenny, I know he's probably reading from a text in front of him, is what was he thinking with that pronunciation in the first place? <laughs> yeah, I, well, it's like you know that um, there are tons of people there with him recording everything, and I'm sure he's got a producer. And everything like that. I just, you would think that that would be something they checked beforehand. I know. But, I mean, that's got to be the only complaint about the entire narration of the book, though. I pictured a couple of guys in a glass booth, like he's like, in Dandelion. And the guy's going, whoa, do, do we say something? Do we, should we say something? No, 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 no. Um, n- but he's he's going to freak out, okay? Let's just he's going to get so mad at us if we, if we correct him. It's like, dude, we're over a thousand pages into the book. I just think we should. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <look>. exactly. <laughs> I, I would love to, to see the person who, like, uh, when they found out that it was pronounced dandelion, have to go in and cut and paste his uh, re-recording of him saying dandelion, you know, in that one. I think that'd be that'd be awesome. Yeah, um, I gotta say, I really enjoyed this book a lot, and this book had some uh, real emotion to it. I thought, and oh yeah, I totally agree. Th- this book, I was I was actually talking to a couple people who are, are reading it. And it's got a very different feeling to it than the last book, but mm-hmm. I almost, um, I don't want to say I enjoyed it more, but it, it felt very, very meaningful to me. Yeah, it ends on a really great note, and uh, I think that's the thing as going for it. It's so funny, what, if you were to ask me, you know, what what is your favorite story in the book, because, you know, it's a series of uh, short stories all into one book. I would say which whichever one I was reading at the time, I was highly enjoying. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then when it was over, I would say that the story, Sword of Destiny, and something more are really just fantastic uh, there at the end of the book. But when you go back to The Bounds of Reason, which I immediately started listening to the audiobook when I finished uh, reading it, just to, you know, keep keep it all in my brain, keep it all floating at the top, you know. Yeah. Don't get too, uh, don't lose everything. The Bounds of Reason, that first story is very comical and it's got a lot going on with a lot of characters, you know? Yeah, definitely. And it's funny how if from the way the, the final story, something more, and then you go back to, oh, this is more lighthearted at the beginning of the book. You know what I mean? It, it yeah, definitely. I, it was it was kind of interesting because I was like, as I was reading it, I was like, okay, there's he's doing a lot of stuff that's that's completely different than in the first book. I mean, we don't have nearly as much um, tie-ins with the fairy tales and, and everything like that. But mm-hmm. uh, I, I agree with you. It almost felt like the first couple stories felt a little bit darker than anything we encountered in the last book. But then once you get to the to the story about the Doppler, then you kind of get that fun uh, feeling again. Yeah, yeah. If that makes sense. See, the bounds of reason. Uh, it's it starts out great with uh, um, Geralt has has been hidden in the sewer somewhere, and people are waiting for him to come up. He's been down there for a, quite a while, so the people are kind of getting like, "Hey, he's not coming back. He's dead. Let's just take his stuff." <laughs> yeah. Which I thought was great, and uh, the uh, the town alderman or whatever he is, he's just like, no, I don't think that's a good idea. And they're like, well, you should just shut up and mind your own business, because we're taking it. And then this guy shows up, and he's like, no, I don't think that'll be a good idea. 
And yeah. he's got these two, uh, and he's unarmed. And they're like, what are you going to do? By the way, Peter Kenny's voices for all these characters are fantastic. He's like, what yeah, are you going to do about it? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love his, like, well, there, there's a, a, a constant character that I've, I've found running throughout uh, this um, these books that I've figured. It's, it's a certain type of character that, that Geralt uh, gets, like, encounters all the time, and that's the character of Stupid Jerks, yes. you know? And his, his voice for Stupid Jerks is, like, it just it, it, it captures it so well, you know? Yeah, it is. I, I think most recently there's a character named Beanpole, and he kind of reminds me of Beanpole. I just love the way he does that voice. Uh, yeah, I, I I was really curious. I would like to like find the the Beanpole prequel to figure out how he got the name Beanpole. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Geralt comes up out of the sewer, and oh, uh, uh, the man he's unarmed, and these two warrior women step up, and they look like badasses with tattoos on their face and stuff. And all the guys like back down, like, whoa, we're not going to mess with them. They look scary. They're Zircanian warriors, which uh, from birth, they're raised to fight, I guess. Right. Yeah, I think so. And I love uh, when uh, Geralt comes up and he has this dead basilisk and uh, he can tell, like, just looking around, like something was going down like before he showed up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's like, don't worry, all your stuff's there. And then one of the warrior women chops the dude's head off. Who remember? Yeah, he, he drew a knife, and we learned that Borch or Three Jackdaws is the guy's name. I gotta say this much: uh, at the end of the Last Wish, it comes with a bonus chapter at the very end of the book, where you can read a preview to Sword of Destiny, and it had this brief part of the story in it with Three Jackdaws in it. And I read, oh, okay. I read that right after I finished The Last Wish, just curious. And I was just like, ah, oh, damn it. I wish I could read that book right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So uh, in terms of timeline about how these were released, were these books released right one after another? Or like, did they come? Do you know if they came after the the novels or do, how, how was that? Okay, uh, here's out. the thing. A lot of these stories individually released in a Polish magazine called Fantastica. Oh, okay. And that makes says, sense. Sword of Destiny is the second book in the Witcher series in terms of story chronology. Although the original Polish edition was published in 1992 before The Last Wish. So it's like the publishers were like, oh, let's grab these stories and we'll put them out. And uh, we'll grab these stories and we'll put them out in another book kind of a thing. But it's like over time, uh, and I guess when we got these books in the U.S., people are like, no, 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 there's the correct order. I showed you that screenshot. I bought the box set of the first three Witcher novels, and those have one, two, and three on them. Uh, okay, I so see. I can see some people are like, hey, I want to read these Witcher books. They're, they're going to start with Blood of Elves, but in reality, they should start with The Last Wish. So it's pretty confusing, isn't it? Yeah, I'm super, like, I'm, I'm kind of wondering, like, how you would really even uh, enjoy those books without knowing the backstory of all these characters. Because it, it seems to me like if you were to just jump in, uh, not knowing the, the, the relationship between Geralt and Yennefer and also his relationship with dandelion like uh see i did it i changed it you know a oh. seamless cha change to it uh, uh <laughs> um it would be very confusing so i think the the call of doing the short stories first was was a very very good idea yeah i i'm glad i found that little article or whatever that i was like it was titled so you want to read the witcher books <laughs> And it was like, here's the order you should read them in. And I was like, oh, that, okay. Th so, that reminds me of your uh, title for So You Think You Can Dance from so, back in the... So, you think you, think you can dance? <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> so in uh, The Bounds of Reason, uh, Geralt uh, meets three jackdaws. He's a very interesting guy with these two warrior women. And I think it describes him as a knight, kind of like a... Uh, he's. Uh, would you say he's girthful knight? He's kind of heavy set. Is that's the way I picture yeah. him anyway. And uh, yeah, I think he presents himself as as working for like a you know a very rich lord. 
Yeah, he he seems to have plenty of money, and he even says, hey, would you like to come with us and uh, get a bite to eat and a drink? And Geralt's like, you do know I'm a witcher, right? (laughs) And he's like, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. He's like, uh, you say it like it's a bad thing. He's like, well, some people, I think he says some, he's, you say it like as if you were a, a leper and he goes, well, some people would rather, you know, hang out with a leper than a witcher. And he's like, well, you know, I'd like to hang out with you. And they go and they get a bite to eat. And I love this bit. They go to the pensive dragon to get some food. And I'm just a sucker for any of these kind of type of stories with where they describe the meals that they're eating, the stews yeah. and the, the booze that they're drinking, and they're having a great old time. And uh, he immediately starts talking to him, you know, being a witcher, the kind of creatures that you've killed and the reasons you kill them. And he's like wondering if he's ever gone after, gone after any dragons. And uh, apparently, this is a thing with. Geralt, he's like, no, I don't kill dragons. And he, is, he has this kind of thing where he's talking about order and chaos and how, like, you would describe dragons as the chaos side of things and you need to protect order from chaos. And Geralt doesn't see it that way at all. The only reason they are in the realm of chaos is because man attacks them. They see him as, like, this trophy, this prize that they must defeat. And uh, I believe that he even says there aren't many dragons around anymore, are there? Yeah, no, I think he was saying that, that first of all, a golden dragon is pretty much a myth. And yeah. all the other dragons, you know, um, have basically been eradicated because of their treasure hoard. Yeah, and uh, he even says, like, he describes, like, there's black dragons, which are actually brown. There are red dragons, which are actually more of a brick color. And I thought that was really cool. And then there are green yeah. dragons. Yeah, I love like the, the the way, just the amount of detail and specific, uh, like j- just details about all these different kinds of creatures that are in this book. Yeah, it it is really cool. It's almost like whenever we're introduced to a new creature, it's like, oh, those exist too. Oh, okay. And at this point, I just believe that in the Witcher world, like anything that you can think of exists. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I need to stop being surprised. I know mean, there's going to be vampires, there's werewolves, there's zombies, there's trolls, gnomes, uh, sprites. Ex- uh, except for actual devils. They don't exist. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. Deal <laughs> Yeah. And what's funny is I love when uh, they're sitting here eating and stuff. He keeps looking over at Taya and Vea, and they seem to be, you know, laughing at each other, speaking in this foreign language. And it looks like they're getting drunker. You know, they're getting more tipsy, and maybe they're going to want to start a fight or something. And there's this great moment where uh, Three Jackdaws says describes them like the perfect companions or whatever. And Geralt's like, yes, they're mighty warriors. And he's like, no, 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 I'm talking about in bed. (laughs) Geralt's like, oh, okay. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And And they end up kind of liking him, don't they? Yeah, they kind of smile. And he's like, oh, they like you, Geralt. And there's a part where he disappears for a bit. And while he's gone, he asks one of them, like, what are you doing hanging around this guy? Like, why do you find this guy attractive and a great companion or whatever? And she's like... He's beautiful, and he's just like yeah, the most beautiful. Okay. It's it's also interesting, like uh, in these books, like who is attracted to Girl and who's not. Like he, the people who are attracted to him are very, very attracted to him. But it also seems like there are quite a few people who are very repelled by him as well. Yeah, yeah. I just uh, he's a certain type, I guess. <laughs> exactly. What's uh, funny is. Uh, They all basically, you know, they don't really get into it. It's like a chapter break, but uh, three jackdaws orders a giant tub for them all to bathe in together. And we don't get to see that conversation happen, (laughs) you know. (laughs) Yeah, I love the uh, the eagerness and the excitement of the innkeeper as he's just like shelling out cash. Yeah. And the guy's like, oh, yeah, I I can bring the tub up and fill it with hot water. Sure. He's like, I need a tub. Okay, we can do that for four people. (laughs) Four people? Whoa, yeah, we can do it, you know. (laughs) Right away, sir. You know, uh-huh. This guy's dropping a lot of cash here. 
And I was thinking, like, gosh, how long would that take for them to, like, heat up a tub of water, you know, haul all that hot water up the stairs? Um, you know, they had to be waiting for that for quite a while. So it's probably good we got the chapter break. Yeah, and it's funny because I was even thinking, I wonder if, like, maybe they get a sorcerer to conjure up it or something, but maybe not. But in the next story, I kind of get an answer to that question. which really <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Funny. I was going to bring that up. <laughs> And it's funny because I don't know a lot about the Witcher lore until we're now reading these books, but I have seen images of Geralt always in a bathtub. I don't know if you've seen that before. No, I haven't. I haven't seen but that. Apparently it's a thing and it's an image. And tr- sure enough, in The Last Wish, there was a bathing scene with him in a tub. And now here is another scene that we didn't get to see, but we knew he was going to take a bath. But sure enough, in the next story, there's another a uh, Geralt bath. So he takes a lot of so, baths. Is the, t- is the teaser uh, teaser trailer for the Netflix show just like him in a bunch of different bathtubs? That's what I want to see now. in the next Because <laughs> we've just seen a teaser. When we see a main trailer, I already told uh-huh. you, like, I want to see some dandelion in that trailer. Yeah, definitely. I want to know, uh, because there's so much humor in these books, I want there to be humor in the series as well. They oh, know. yeah. So when they're, uh, I forgot where he is asking, he's trying to get Geralt to come with him as a companion somewhere, like the Hengfors or something like that. They're going to go do something and he's thinking about it when they meet up on this bridge and this guard. It's so funny how this happens, but it happens all the time in these stories where is that dandelion? Dan- uh, get on! <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like, there's dandelion all of a sudden. He's like, yes, I've been trapped here because I need this. What was the thing called? You needed uh, something of intent. Oh, uh, a safe. Co- uh, what was a it? Safe conduct. Safe, safe conduct or something. Yeah. yeah. He won't let me through. I have no safe conduct. And he tells him the story of King Nidamir. He's in the area hunting a dragon. And he tells the story of a, a green dragon that had come through this town and I guess it was make, being a nuisance and eating sheep and the sheep bagger came up with this idea of poisoning a dead sheep and stuffing it with hemlock and all sorts of things to poison yeah that that uh, the character of the sheep bagger I love because he's he's supposed to be down home you know type of salt of the earth guy but he's just like so eager to poison everything <laughs> yeah. you know it's pretty hilarious and i love sure enough later on the actual dragon slayer type people they're like he gives us a bad reputation you know if the other people hear news of this <laughs> yeah exactly be, this is gonna be all over where people are poisoning sheep and they even want uh dandelion to write a song basically condemning the sheep bagger <laughs> <laughs> and what a failure he is. I, I love uh, how he, w- what he was describing about like how they, uh, they like stuffed it full of all this stuff and got like the priest to pray over it. And did all like, there was all these very specific things <laughs> that they did to the sheep. It's hilarious. Uh, yeah. The local apothecary added some carbuncle or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's so funny. And I love where he even says, even the, I forget what he said. He actually used the word retarded uh, at one point. And I was like, dandelion or something. Oh, man. Not cool. He was like, the town idiot. (laughs) And and Geralt's like, you're you're lying, dandelion. He goes, I'm merely embellishing Geralt. And he goes, that's the same thing. (laughs) (laughs) But basically, he's telling the story. There's a dragon and a local dragon and it hasn't been killed. It was poison. I think he even described it had shot flames out of the front and back of the dragon. Or was it just smoke? Like smoke came out of the dragon's ass, basically. Uh, yeah, I, I missed that detail. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they're looking for basically where a dragon keeps its gold in its cave. So they're all after it. And he describes the different people who have come through. But and yet Dandelion hasn't been able to. And right now, Geralt just doesn't care. He's not interested in this dragon, uh, you know, for himself. Until he hears a certain sorceress came by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he's like, really? I, I, before we get into that, I do want to mention with with the pronunciation of Dandelion, like it really does change the, the way I view the character. Mm-hmm. 
with, with it being uh, so specifically like dandelion, like it's uh, instead of it just being dandelion, which is an interesting name, but it's when you told me before that in the Polish version it was buttercup, and then it's sw- you know it switched over to dandelion for the English. I was thinking like, well, that doesn't really. Um, it doesn't seem like a one-to-one comparison, you know, going from Buttercup to Dandelion. But then since it's Dandelion, it it, it really, like, it kind of just changed, changed the character for me quite a bit. He's he's pretty, I mean, yeah, like, is he a buffoon? Is he silly? We know he's smart. He cares about Geralt. There are times he just does some ridiculous things. He's he's definitely, uh, there are times where he does something, and I as I'm reading, I'm like, oh, that dandelion, you know? <laughs> exactly, exactly. But then there's also times where, like, in the, uh, the Last Wish, where he's tied up and they're about to kill uh, Geralt, and he's, like, totally brave and saying, you know, we're going to get everybody to come after you. So he's a, a very complex, interesting character. Mm-hmm. Uh, but changing the name to actually pronouncing it Dandelion, I like much more than the other one. Yeah. Um, but it, it was surprising in my mind how much the character changed as I was reading it. Right. For me, anyway. Yeah, I, I get that. And at one point... He sends the women away, Taya and Vea, to get beer as they're just stuck there at the bridge. And they return with a wizard. And uh, that wizard's name is Dora Gray. Yeah, great guy. He seems like a very interesting character. And he wants through, but of course he can't get through because he has no safe conduct. And I love the guard guy. What is it? He's not a... Um, what is the word... Centurion. Yeah, he's a like a denturian or something. Denturian, yeah, something like that. I don't yeah. remember. I was like, "What the hell is that?" But he's like, "I'm not a centurion yet." But uh, it's not until they describe that Yennefer has passed through and she had a safe conduct that Geralt immediately tries to bribe him, and uh, three jackdaws is like. Oh, you know, hey, if you want to do that, and he's got all this money, and he basically, he essentially bribes the guy and lets him through, and he's like, what do I say to my masters, you know, to the king, he'll know I let you through, and Dorgray's like, tell him you are very afraid, and he sets a... (laughs) Of this. (laughs) Yeah. Sets a tree on fire, and it's just like, Uh oh... Because oh, we know that there are sorcerers. Uh, we don't know the extent of their abilities. Just when we see different things, you know, s- different things Jennifer can do or different things Dora Gray can do. And we get to see some things in this story. You know, they can set things on fire. They can uh, turn you into animals, etc. I think it's cool just learning a little bit at a time what they're able to do. Yeah, they have all these amazing powers, but they all kind of end up being like giant douchebags, you yeah. know. Like yeah. it's it's just interesting how they're uh, they are portrayed in yeah. this world. I think some people might even. Uh, what's great is when you hear the names of them; they seem like they're famous people, kind of like celebrities, right? Yes. You know, at least some of them are. So uh, when we we get to meet, <clears throat> oh, by the way, during this moment. We get to hear all the interesting people who have passed through that are going to kill the dragon. One of them is Ike of Denisley, who's like this, uh, this, what you would, I would think is an atypical knight in shining armor kind of thing, wouldn't you? Yeah, he's, he's everything you would think a dragon slayer would be. Yeah, and he's got this honor and this code that he goes by. He will take no money. He is doing it just because, you know, to protect people or whatever. And then there are the Reavers who are, like, disgusted by him. Like, oh, (laughs) we're here to kill the dragon. What did you think about those guys, the the The, Reavers? So the the Reavers, like, uh, this part was a little... There were so many characters in this (laughs) part that it was a little bit confusing as to who... Were the Reavers... They weren't the dwarves, right? Yeah, yeah, they were the dwarves, like Bohol. They were, okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure if they were the dwarves or if it was another set of guys. Like that was a little bit confusing to me. Even though I listened to it twice, I was still a little kind of uh, confused as to who was who in that in that section. So right. Beanpole and all them—they were all dwarves, then, correct? Yes, yes. And Boholt was like their leader. There was Kennet and a guy named Gar, 
and uh, then there's Ike, but then they also were dealing with Yennefer, and, you know, one person was like, you know, all you need is a good sorcerer, and that could take out a dragon. You don't need all those other people. And so they're basically all there to do the same job and kind of talking about when they can, you know, they don't, the dwarves are worried they're going to get screwed out of the deal. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Well, the dwarves, like you were asking me about the Reavers, what I thought of them. I thought they were all very well written, uh, amazingly flushed out, awful, awful people. (laughs) You know? Yeah. Yeah, they are awful. And also the sheep baggers there too. And they all can't stand that guy. <laughs> yeah, they can't stand him. And he's just like, well, wait till my friends come. We'll figure it out. We'll just poison it again. The dialogue with the dwarves is really funny. And there's a great bit where when Yennefer shows up, they pretend like they don't see her. And they're like, oh, what's that smell? Do you smell that? <laughs> yeah. And they're, she's like, oh, charmed. You know, and she has to threaten them with magic, basically. And she sees... Geralt there and what's funny is like the last time we saw Yennefer and Geralt from The Last Wish they were getting along pretty well we'd heard that they'd broken up we weren't sure why but in this story she is not happy to see him no not at all she's uh eh. even one point you know when she leaves you know they're like hey where'd Geralt go it's like maybe he went to relieve himself (laughs) you know and he shows (laughs) up there to talk to her and she's like she has like uh, you know lightning coming off her fingers. She's so annoyed at him. And it's one not- thing I was wondering about this story uh, about your opinion of it. Th- there are giant chunks of dialogue in this story. Were you able to really absorb most of that, or d- like d- did you feel a little bit uh, confused with all of the just giant chunks of, of dialogue? I I, th- I honestly think this might. Uh, be where when you could actually physically read it, it helps a lot more because when I was listening to the audio version, he does so many different voices to the different characters. I could see how that could become like a lot, you know, cause yeah, it was, long, there's quite a long conversation there between the dwarves and, you know, they're talking about Ike and how like, Oh, you know, he's just here for honor or whatever. It's disgusting. And there's a lot of funny things going on in there. They're used to uh, Dandelion being there because they he's been there before and they don't mind him being there because he'll write a beautiful sonnet or something. And they're passing around a flask, which what do they call it in these stories? They, oh, it's a demijohn. Yeah, a demijohn. And uh, so, yeah, I was following that pretty well. But I could tell like when I was listening to the audiobook, like, wow, there's a lot of voices going on here, you know. It, it, it was all like really, really great dialogue, and I love the conversation. It's not like it lost me. It's just there was so much packed in, like so much world building and detail packed into these yeah. conversations it's a that it was very easy to miss stuff if you weren't completely one hundred percent paying attention. Yeah, it's a lot of information going on, and I think basically, uh, Yennefer she wants this dragon because she needs some parts of the dragon for some elixirs etc and it actually turns out Dora Gray he doesn't want to to kill any dragon he wants to protect the dragon he's more of a kind of an eco-friendly uh, sorcerer wouldn't you say yes <laughs> and uh, Geralt he's just there because Yennefer is once he heard her name that's all he cared about yeah he didn't care <laughs> most of the time they're like what are you what are you doing here yeah, and they're like, Witcher, what are you doing here? And there's even a point where she go, you know, she's like, oh, I get it. You wanted to see your ex, maybe hoping that we'd roll around in some sheepskin, look at the stars. And Geralt was like, is she reading my mind right now? Or <laughs> yeah. I thought that was hilarious. I'm so like curious as to the backstory of why they broke up. Like we get little hints of... Uh, of things and we kind of know the main reason, but I'm really, really interested to find out the actual, like what actually happened. Right. I almost, it sounds like at least from this story is he just walked out on her. Yeah. They spent quite a bit of time together. I think it was it like, did it say four years? I think so. Three or four years, something like that. And one day he was just gone and she's like, what the hell? 
And she well, it, it seems to me like he, like she, desperately desires a child, right? And yes. he uh, is so afraid because death follows him everywhere that he doesn't want to have that responsibility. I guess. Yeah. Well, his main thing that we learn in the next story also is that he listens to the entire lore about a Witcher, which is we don't have emotions. And I, and Yennefer, and also I think to a significant dandelion is try to tell him that like that's bullshit like it's obvious you have emotions you know? yeah exactly you feel something he's like i don't i'm a witcher and it's like why is this bothering you so much then he's like yeah i don't know i don't know i you know girl i you just want to knock him in the head and go dude <clears throat> that's what love is what you're feeling right now that's what you're <laughs> exactly. miserable and uh i think it's going to take a while for him to that to get through to him you know, it's obvious being a witcher and his training and all that messed him up to a degree. Yeah, definitely. And he has this code he follows. But what I I think it's interesting, this has nothing to do with the book. I'm thinking about witchers in general. Something in the world caused there to be this society who was like, we need guys to go hunting monsters all the time. Someone who does that job. And I want to know more about that. Yeah. you know, this order of like, Hey, we need a guy policing these monsters. People are getting killed all the time and stuff. So anyway, the next day they go out searching from the dragon. And I thought this was really cool imagery in the book of like this, you know, wagon train of them all going and hunting. And, uh, there's great conversations between Gore, door gray and Geralt and, Dora Gray's for sure that Geralt's there to kill the dragon, but he's just like, no, I really am not here. A lot of people, <laughs> you know, they always assume that about Geralt, that he's just there to... I think he even says, like, I heard you killed the creature in the town, you know. There's a lot there's a lot of talk about you there, and now you're going to bag a dragon and get even more of a reputation. <laughs> yeah, he's got this reputation for just being this, like, bloodthirsty monster, basically. But it's it's very... It's very far from the truth. Right. And there's uh, an avalanche, too. I, I, I kind of forgot about that for a second. But there's an avalanche in Geralt and Yennefer fall. And it almost seems like for a moment that they're going to fall to their death. And he's like, Yennefer, I need to tell you, you know. And then they get rescued. <laughs> he basically, yeah. he's trying to say he's sorry to her. Like if she could forgive him. That kind of yeah, thing. they're dangling from the bridge, right? And then yeah. Ike uh, rescues them. Yes. It's Ike of Dennisley. He's like, uh, they're like, thank you, Ike. And he's like, basically like, I had to do it because people were in need. But I don't really like you people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He basically he, that, that character Jennifer. was, um, he, like I said, he was everything you would think a, a dragon, like a righteous dragon slayer would be, almost to the point yeah. of being incredibly annoying. There was even a bit, I think it, was it Dora Gray? Somebody really insults Yennefer, like, maybe you should be off making children instead of this endeavor, and it's just like, ooh, like, ow, oh, that hurt. Because like, don't they realize <laughs> yeah. that she can't have children? And yeah, that was like, that was harsh. And uh, I wondered if they knew that or if they were just saying something and it just ended up stinging, you know? Oh, I think he had to have known it. I mean, it seems pretty common knowledge that uh, witchers and sorcerers and sorceresses don't have the ability to procreate. And I'd like to know more about Yennefer and why she wants a child. I mean, I know like a lot of people want children, but it almost like in her nature if somebody tells her no you this is impossible you can't have it she's like bullshit i'm gonna have it i'm gonna do it yeah that that makes sense because it doesn't seem like she's a, a very motherly type uh <laughs> yeah. so i it, it kind of made me wonder like why she's so eager to have a child but that what you said makes sense like the idea that somebody is denying her something and she's not the type of person who's willing to accept something she can't have that's actually a really good insight yeah, I want to know more about that. And we're introduced to the Golden Dragon, which when the Golden Dragon speaks, where you're like, "Whoa, it talks!" Because I- yeah, it, it, it was it was um, the, he's just very cool. You know what I'm saying? Like the, the dragon just seemed uh, 
to have it all together, I guess, in in a, a way of speaking. Like he, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I thought it was interesting that they ta- spoken of a golden dragon earlier in the story, and now here one was instead of a green dragon. And they're like, well, we're here for the green dragon, but they're like, no, 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 there's a gold dragon. We're going to get it. We're going <laughs> to, we're going to kill this dragon. And this is going to be, you know, there's going to be riches, you know, it's a rare thing. So they're kind of arguing there. And there's even uh, one point where I'm trying to think of the dragon. He challenges them like, I will fight you with honor, but it has to be without magic. It has to be with conventional uh, weapons. I will not fly. I will stay on the ground and I will not breathe fire. And they're like, all right, you know, this seems like a pretty good deal. And Ike of Dennis Lee is like, I will battle the dragon. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That whole moment I thought was hilarious how he's like, you know, he's all geared up. He's in his, uh, his suit, you know. And uh, he goes marching in. I could just picture it like a movie, you know, of him riding up and the dragon preparing. And the dragon basically knocks him on his ass. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. He, there's like all this giant buildup for Ike. And he's, you know, this amazing ri- righteous character who's going to slay this vile creature. And then just gets like his butt handed to him very easily. And I love the dragon says, next. And he, <laughs> yeah. And he's like, oh, F. Uh, it's yeah. funny. And uh, there's a one point where Yennefer, she decides she's going to... I'm trying to think. Remember, this is the first story I read. It's been a while ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's a lot of, Dora Gray, of time since like, I read it. We will not fight this dragon. And No Holt basically gets up in his face until Dora Gray backs down. Yeah, he's like, oh, yeah. Well, he he is basically saying you don't kill legends, and this thing is a legend. It's like the last of its kind. Yeah, it's kind of disgusting. Like, wow, this rare creature no one has ever seen, and it's here, and you just want to kill it. And uh, and it sounds like you have to be quick on the draw if you're a sorcerer, you know, with your wand or whatever, because they could still like punch you in the face or whatever. So you got to be careful. So uh, as the dwarf is right there in his face, he immediately backs down he doesn't do anything well yennefer she's still dead set on attacking the dragon and she even turns against dandelion and Geralt, where they all get tied up and uh she like paralyzes them where they can't move and they all get tied up and then they uh screw over yennefer and tie her up and there's even like this really messed up part where he rips open her blouse where her bosoms are exposed (laughs) yeah and And dandelion won't like leave it alone basically yeah they're like oh we're gonna have our way with you when we're done with this or whatever and she's just like oh i'm gonna kill you guys or whatever and dandelion he keeps like staring and even Geralt's like hey knock it off stop and he's like i'm gonna write a song about (laughs) those yeah the yeah, exactly. And I was like, oh, Dandelion, that is not cool. That That's not okay, Dandelion. Yeah, not cool. But I think he was a little annoyed at her because she pretty much uh, betrayed them in that moment. Oh, it seems like he hates her, you know, from the beginning of this book. He, he, he definitely does not like her. He's definitely Team Geralt. Yeah. In, in this story, he doesn't and, like, uh, he's like, I never understood what you see in this woman and. There's even a great bit about, uh, I don't remember what's, if it's in this story where he's talking about the tides. Oh, well, that's in a later story where he's. Kind yeah, of that's it. Yeah. And he goes, well, actually, Jennifer told me the tides is ca- are caused by the moon. He's like, the moon? The are moon. Crazy? Yeah. <laughs> It's like I, I kind of wish that his story of, in of like of how the tides worked with the uh, giant monster sucking in all the water. I wish that was actually true. <laughs> it sounds believable in this world. Like, oh yeah, it does definitely. So essentially, uh, I'm trying to think of what happens. Ross, help me out here. Okay, they betray. Uh, they betray so the, then the reaver, the reavers they betray them but the the reavers decide to start fighting the dragon correct oh, and then the dragon has they're taking so long that the dragon has arrived he's like i'm here and they're like whoa and uh the sheep herder they ran him off at one point and he's arrived with all the uh 
the uh, his townspeople, but I remember his constabulary. Yeah, yeah. The king has grown so bored with all of this. Like the whole reason that uh, King Nidamir, he's there with Gillenstein. Yeah, that's a great character. There's some kind of prophecy where he will be a dragon slayer, then he will win over this queen and or this princess, and they will be married and all this stuff. But he's like, you know what? Just forget it. I'll just sack that town and do whatever. I <laughs> yeah, want exactly. With them. I don't have yeah, time they, for this dragon shit. Like he's getting so annoyed by it all. Yeah, they they basically weren't asking him what he thought they should do. The the Gildenstern was was dictating what they should do and how they should go about everything. And he finally is like, uh, yeah, um, you know what? Instead of doing all that, we're going to leave because I don't want to get killed by this thing. And I'm just going to sack the town. And if, you know, I don't really care about that princess. All I need is her womb. Yeah, and it was like, geez, like, this guy is very calculated. And when I get sick of her, she may succumb to maybe some kind of food poisoning or something. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, exactly. He's got exactly. And he's out. supposed to be like 13 years old or something like that. Yeah, he sounds terrible. But they do take Ike of Dennis Lee for medical help, at least. So, yeah, exactly. Oh, nice. His legs have been crushed. He's like, yeah, he's probably never going to ride a horse again. But we also see that it was actually the golden dragon was protecting a baby. So apparently the green dragon had a baby and it was protecting it. And that's what this was all about. And what's funny is when I first read the story, uh, Yennefer does an about face. She changes her mind about wanting to kill the dragon. And I was like, why did she do that? It didn't make any sense. But then I realized once she saw that there was a baby involved, she totally does an about face. And is on the side of the dragon at that point. Well, and, and didn't didn't the baby run to her at yeah. one point? It's like, oh. <laughs> exactly. And it, like, exactly. She's freed, and what's so funny? Her legs are freed, and she's casting spells with her feet. Yeah. And I thought that was great. And, she's turning the townspeople like into sheep and lizards and stuff. Well, and also like there's a, there's a part where she's tied up and. Uh, she needs to to be freed, and so she has uh, Geralt do. I believe it's the sign of Ard, uh -huh. and he, you know, and she's worried that it's going to burn her, or whatever. Oh yeah, that's and, how he, or, he burns her. At her burns the ropes on her feet. Mm -hmm. And that seems like it would hurt. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Yeah, I think so. But I was just remembering that. It's all good. So then uh, we find out that the Golden Dragons is actually three jackdaws. And his warrior women were fighting there, too, so that's pretty cool. And it turns out that golden dragons are shapeshifters, and they can turn into things. And now, and I love that uh, the Witcher finally understands Vea's words that he is truly beautiful. The most beautiful, <laughs> because he's a golden dragon. I thought that yeah. was really cool. And also... I like it. I like the part in that conversation after he turns into the the dragon, and he, he's Geralt is basically asking him. Before that, they had a conversation of like, "What's the end goal? Like, what are you shooting for?" And Geralt is kind of like, "I don't know what I'm shooting for. I just kind of live day to day, and wherever I go, I go." But then when uh, he talks to the dragon, who's this incredibly wise mythic creature, he he asks him like, "What's the end goal?" And 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 uh, three jackdaws is like, well, it's this child here. It's this this young dragon. It, this is the goal. Yeah. And I thought that was very interesting because I I felt all the way through this, and I brought it up in the last that Geralt is kind of a character searching for some kind of meaning, and for them to foreshadow, you know, what ends up happening in a later story with this um, encounter that he has with the dragon was was very meaningful. Yeah, I thought so too. Because even he says, looking at Geralt and Yennefer, he tells them that he could tell that they are meant for each other, but they should know that nothing will come from their union. And that meant that they will not have offspring. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't necessarily mean they will have nothing. Yes. Which I thought was really cool. It was a really cool first story. Because, you know, we got dragons right away, right? Yeah, we got dragons, we got dandelion, we got Yennefer. Like it, it, I was, I was expecting a lot of times in these books, it takes a little while 
to uh, to introduce all those characters and introduce like the really cool elements. But this one was right out the gate, and I, I was I was all for it. Yeah, me too. And I was just like, I hope that uh, you know Yennefer and Geralt they patch things up. And then sure enough, in the next story, Shard of Ice, they're together. And uh, I think it's funny because the first story he was like in a sewer, and in this story he's in basically a sewer again, fighting this weird tentacled creature in muck and shit. And <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. He's so in like the horrible. the garbage dump fighting some giant worm. Yeah, it's like a zeagle or something. Uh, I don't a zoigle. Zoigle. And uh, it sounds like a disgusting creature, like basically an octopus that lives in the sewer that uses its tentacles to pull people in and eat them. Yeah, the, the made up names for all of the monsters in these books are awesome, like the Zoigle and the Scalopendromorph and, you know, different things like Strigger, like we got the last time. They actually sound like they could be actual things. Maybe not the Scalopendromorph, um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And, you know, when he returns, he kills the creature when he returns to the room. You know, Yennefer's like, oh, my God, you stink. You smell terrible. And he's like, could you conjure me up a bath? And she's like, would you like fresh water or salt water? And he's like, hey, I'll, tr I'll try salt water. But it's like freezing cold. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, well, can you warm it for me? And she's like, like no. why, why don't we do like hot mountain spring water? That, that, that should be a, an option, right? Yeah. So he's cleaning in cold water, and I love the the moments where uh, it describes how he loves watching her like prepare her stuff. She's working on her spells, or she's got little vials and things like that. And uh, he's kind of fascinated by her the intricate ways she does things, you know. Well, it was it was nice to see a like a very in intimate moment between the two of them because most of the time we see them or or hear anything of their relationship, they're not together. They are angry with one another, and she basically can't stand them. So it was very nice to see a moment of what they were like when they were actually together. Yeah, it was. And even, like, he's, like, weakened, because when his elixirs start to wear off, his body, like, weakens, and it sounds like he just basically goes into a coma for a while. But she's uh, she wants him, you know, in bed with her and... He's just like feels it like giving away all this energy, but she like musters something up. But you know, there's descriptions of her hair and his face and the yeah, and she she conjures up some magical Viagra basically yeah so to get him going <laughs> yeah and it's something that, that lilac and gooseberries is what he it's loves. true and she's there to talk with Istrid and it doesn't sound like. Uh, you know, Geralt really likes this guy. He doesn't even like this town. And they talk about the town is basically called translated from Elven is a shard of ice. Correct. Isn't that where the name yeah. comes from? And he's, he's just irritated to be there. I think he's irritated to be there mostly because, uh, the other wizard that has Yennefer's attention is there, but he, he kind of takes it all out on the town to where, when he goes to the bathhouse, he's like irritated that they didn't offer him a, a prostitute, even though he didn't yes. want one. Yeah. Yeah. It's like he didn't want one, but still they offer one to everyone else. Yeah, it's it's like when you uh, don't invite somebody to your birthday and you know they wouldn't have come anyway, but they get offended because it's just nice to be invited. Yeah, he's basically having a really bad day. Like it's like, He's having a pity party, Jason. Yeah, he is. He's irritated by everything, by everyone, every sound he hears. There's even a gross description of the tavern guy, like... You know, hitting on a twelve-year-old. On a twelve-year-old, yeah. And it was like, oh, and it's like, couldn't you do something about that, Geralt? But he's too involved in his head, I guess. Or so we get to meet uh, the. Oh, I love, one of my favorite moments in this story is actually when he's going to get his money. And there. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and they do the bargaining with the guy. Yeah, there's this guy Hairbolt or something like that, and he's like. I'll take a hundred. And he's like, uh, 85. And he's like, no, a mm -hmm. hundred. And he's like, 90. 90. <laughs> yeah. I love that little haggling they do. I thought it was great. Yeah. And he meets this guy named Zakata. Zakata. And he's like, oh, 
he sees uh, Geralt as a challenge. Like, hey, I bet I could take this guy in a fight. You know, I've heard about these witchers. Yeah, when I first read that, like, I for some reason, I was thinking that that was the same as Ike for some reason. Like, I, I guess I missed when I read it, read it the first time that uh, that Ike had gotten completely crushed but, and wouldn't be able to be on the, the horse anymore. And I was thinking, like, that it was the same guy and that, you know, since he lost to the dragon, he was basically, like, you know, completely changed his character. And uh, on the second reading, I was like, oh, that's that's not at all the case. <laughs> I also like how they describe that Hairbolf, he is an alderman who uh, never loses power because of Zakeda. He just threatens whoever, because apparently there's turnover with these aldermans a lot. And, like, you know, there's people coming and going all the time, but not me. I'm always here. Because, basically... Yeah, because he's got the muscle. Yeah, he's got muscle. And uh, that's where he kind of talks about Istrid and what he's got going on and... Geralt goes to meet up with Istrid. Oh, and there's also, I don't want to pass up this point where th- that guy, Cicada, he's like, you know, you can't visit him without your sword, Airbolt. You know, you can't go armed. And he's like, oh, okay. And he gives him his sword. And he's like, whoa, you just give me your sword. Give me your that? sword. Yeah, exactly. I think it's because Geralt doesn't find him threatening at all. No, not at all. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I love it. He's like, if somebody asked me for my sword, there'd be a fight or something. You notice how, like, I'm channeling Peter Kenny when I think of their voices? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Did you listen to the whole book? I've listened to bits. I didn't listen to it all in a row. But I definitely uh, uh, went back and listened to... When I finished Sword of Destiny and Something More, those two stories, I listened to all of it. Oh, I see. Okay. But I definitely wanted to hear Dainty's voice, so I, I listened to a lot of that also. But he goes to meet Istrid, and there's this great kind of like, they're just basically a stare down between them. And there's this great moment where Geralt just kind of talking about how he has all these vials and things in jars. And he talks about how Yennefer, she has the phallus of a troll, a giant phallus of a (laughs) troll. And she even has a unicorn where she likes them to make love on. And Geralt... Yeah, that was so random. Yeah, and Geralt doesn't really like that. He doesn't think it's comfortable. In fact, it's the they, worst. they even broke it. <laughs> yeah. And, and I thought that was hilarious. Just a hilarious little development there. But um, Istrid's basically saying that I... Does it sound like he proposed to Yennefer? Like, we need to be an item? Are we going to be... Are they going to be wed? Or are they just going to be an item where they're together? Yeah, I think he just wants basically exclusive rights to her, and she doesn't seem like that that type of person. Yeah, and he's like Geralt, being your witcher who feels nothing, it should you should have no problem with just saying goodbye to Yennefer, and she's mine now. So, if you would do that for me, that would be great. And Geralt's like, wait a second, what? Like, no, that's not. <laughs> yeah, I, I love this idea of that like witchers just don't have the ability to feel emotion, even though the entire time. He's feeling the emotion of irritation in the town, you know, like, and, and anger. So, and Istrid's even like, like, well, she's just using you, you know, you can't feel anything. She's just, you're a sex toy, basically, you know, you're her kind of like little toy that Paramore. Yeah. And so, you know, hand her over, buddy. And he's just like, well. No, she's with me now, you know. In fact, we just made love last night. And Istrid's like, well, actually, we just well, made we love. We made love this morning. morning. And it was like, ooh. Like when you get <laughs> burned. That, I think I even did that. I went, ooh, damn. Damn, <laughs> Yennefer. Come and on, I, Yennefer. I want to like you. I think at that point, girl's just like, yeah, I'll be leaving. And he took off. And the, uh, at what point, Geralt... Does Yennefer create the birds, which are called, what are those birds called? Oh, uh, man. Uh, a black something. A black. Uh, yeah, I forget. I'll look at this Dean story real quick. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he goes to talk with. Was it a kestrel? 
Yeah, Black Kestrel. Thank you. Whoa, I pulled that one out of the depths. Nice. I wanted to say minstrel, but I was like, that is not right, Jason. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole different idea. Yeah, yeah. Black Kestrel. And she's, we don't know what she's doing now, but at the end of the story, this is definitely, this is one of those stories where you go on a walk after you read it to kind of think about what you've read and what happened. Am I right? Because yeah, I think so. I, I there, um, yeah. It, basically, like because with the 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 Kestrel, it seemed to me like did she make the Kestrel or was that a gift from him? She created it. But did she create one for him as well, or she? Did there, there was some sort of connection between him and the Kestrel. I think originally she created the Kestrel for Istrid. Here's what I think. I think she was going to deliver a no thank you note, essentially. But mm-hmm. when Geralt comes there, kind of incensed, and he's like uh, pissed off about it, and she's like, can you just say those words? You know, admit to me that you have feelings for me. And he's basically like, oh, I see. I, he's like, I can't. I can't do it. And. Is, do you think it's he can't do it because he feels he doesn't have the ability to feel emotion, or he's worried about uh, about what his future holds? I I feel as though he feels like he can't feel love. He uh-huh. can't give her what she would want in the relationship, and she's basically telling him over and over, like, "Yes, you can." It's kind of like this in a relationship when, like, someone's like, "Oh, I feel so unattractive. I'm so ugly." And your significant other's like, that is ridiculous. You are not. You're the most handsome person I know or something. And you're like, yeah, uh-huh. you just have to say that. But it's kind of like that. It seems like Yennefer's... Like, remember, uh, Istrid calls him a mutant. And Geralt kind of says it out loud. And he goes, what? You know, I'm just a mutant. And Yennefer does not like when he uses that word about himself. She tells him yeah. not to say it in her presence because... She just thinks that's a load of shit that he tells himself. Like, he's insulting himself. I'm just a mutant. I'm not a human. I don't feel things. And I think she realizes at that point that... what I, I'm kind of miss, messing up my timetable. At one point, Geralt and Nistrid, they vow to fight each other to the death, which I think is hilarious. Yeah, I love how they were like, do you feel kind of stupid? And he's like, yeah, totally. And I was like, yeah, I feel really stupid too, but we're, we're going to do this thing. Yeah, we're we're doing this, buddy. I am taking you down tomorrow at dawn or whatever. And they're like, okay, let's do this. And even the town alderman is like, we need this wizard here, this sorcerer. You will not be killing him. And he's like, oh, I'm afraid I am. And he's like, you know, he's like, maybe I'll die instead but uh, we're going to do this thing. You know, it's yeah, he's like, well, if you, if you, uh, I'm going to six the card on you. And he's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point, uh, Yennefer, she creates a black Kestrel, a second one. She's like, it's for you. But Geralt doesn't understand what it means at that point. Yeah. But it basically means is she's not going to have these two men fighting to the death over her. She's not going, she's just taken off. You know. Yeah, she wants to have a little bit of say in the situation also. Yeah, this is ridiculous. These two men fighting for her. She's just like, oh, and whoever wins, I... It's funny, they even say, like, whoever wins this fight needs to disappear for a while because she's going to be pissed. And he's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, go to the far ends of the of the lands before she finds you. And then maybe in, like, five years, it'll be okay to come out of <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I thought that was hilarious. Because could you imagine if Istrid killed Geralt? I can't see oh, Yennefer yeah, yeah, ever forgiving him. I can see her forgiving Geralt for killing Istrid, but not the other way around. Maybe yeah. that's just because I'm Team Geralt. Yeah, me too. Yeah, Team Geralt, and he. I wonder if there's anybody who's Team Istrid. Like no, Istrid, man, he's my boy. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, he's got it. He's got that phallus <laughs> of a troll. It's like, ah, oh. but so. Uh, Geralt ends up sleeping in the stables and there's even a bit there where he goes to like a, an inn. Do they always call them inns? They don't go to, or tavern. Taverns, he's, yeah. He's sitting there and that's where that guy, Erbolf, Herbolf, he threatens him and he's mm-hmm. having none of it. And in fact, he 
kind of starts insulting Yennefer, calls her a whore, and uh, Geralt does that cool thing with the knife between the Yeah, fingers. right between his fingers. <laughs> and it, like, scares the crap out of him. I've always wanted to be that type of guy, you know? <laughs> like, the guy who's, like, really good with a knife. And then it's like, oh, yeah, you probably cut yourself a lot. And that's when I was like, yeah, I'm out. I'm good. And there's even a point where Geralt's deciding, like, hey, he's going to, you know, he's had enough with this. If he can't have Yennefer and he can't ever have feelings and all this stuff, it's, he's going to, is he trying to commit suicide by mugging, I guess? I guess. I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure really what his intention was there at he, that point he goes out and he's mugged by these guys and they see he's a witcher and they're like oh he's a witcher run away and they just run off and he he's like next time you want to commit suicide just you know hang yourself in a state horse stable yeah <laughs> exactly hang yourself from your reins so the next day Geralt's already he's gonna go and fight Istrid but not before Zakata and his men are gonna have a little fight and I love this bit here where Geralt doesn't have time for this shit and he basically you know Zakata is just talking shit to him and finally he just punches him in the face and then he <laughs> he knocks him down like his I think he spits some teeth out he's all bloody and then Geralt kicks him in the head <laughs> yeah and then he hears a sword pull and he turns around and he's like oh hey you're gonna you want some of this and he's like shing and they're like all right, and they run away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then when he shows up to Istrid, Istrid's standing there with a sword, and he's like, "Why do you have a sword?" And he goes, "Cause I'm gonna fight you not using magic, basically." And then Geralt realizes what Istrid's doing is he's going to commit suicide by duel. But he, I think he wants to doom the relationship between him and Yennefer, don't you think? Like, uh, basically, if if Geralt kills him. Then she's going to be so upset with with uh, Geralt that he won't. She'll, she'll hopefully fall out of love with him too. Oh, I didn't think about that. But that's really that's clever of him. Like he will basically ruin everything. Yeah, it's like if I can't have her, you can't have her either. And it, so I'm going to make you so disgusting to her that both of us won't get her. Right. That was the impression that I got. No, anyway. no, that makes a lot of sense. And Geralt, luckily, he. Uh, smartens up when he sees that he has a black kestrel and he had to note basically a bird messenger who said that uh she was out it's of over it. buddy it's i'm gone pack up your troll phallus and leave we're done <laughs> well that's when uh, Geralt's like well i've got something to do and he's like where are you going and he's basically like i've got a black kestrel that's got a message for me. And he's like, no, you will kill me. You're going to kill me. It's like, no, I'm gone. But later, I thought that was yeah. an interesting story. It's kind of a sad story too. That It uh, is. Yeah. Because it's like, here you think, you know, he makes the wish to have him and Yennefer's fates tied to each other. She seems to be really into him and everything. And you're just thinking like, oh, well she's, you know, they're made for each other. They're destined to be together. But she's like, you know, with him, with this other guy on the side, and, remember, and uh, she was there visiting Istrid because Istrid has made her some promises about helping her have a child. Well, that's the whole thing that's crazy that you find out. It's like she ta brings Geralt along to this town where she can meet up with this other guy. It's pretty jacked up. Yeah, it is. Maybe does she think that? I mean, she tries to tell Geralt that he does have genuine feelings but he says he doesn't but yet she does something like that is she just trying to see how he'll react to it I don't know I don't know because she definitely does seem to have some sort of a genuine connection to Istrid I mean she calls him by his first name and she actually likes him but you know I, I don't know I don't think her mind is really made up as to as to who she wants to be with when she moves brings or comes into the town but for some reason, she decides to choose Geralt, which is, uh, I'm not 100% sure why, other than that it's his story, you know? Yeah, I also think that maybe Geralt thinks if she ever succeeds in having a child, he won't be able to love it, maybe? Maybe. I think he's just so worried about, like, about knowing his destiny and knowing, you know, he had that prophecy uh, from Yala of about the blood on the on you know and some giant monster and everything like that i think he just knows that he's kind of doomed and doesn't want anybody to get very close yeah he's uh except for her and 
yet when he hears her name, he goes running, though. <laughs> exactly. He's now, very a complicated person. The next story is Eternal Flame, which takes place in the... I thought this was cool. It takes place in a big city called Novigrad. Like this huge city. And I gotta say that this story, the way it began, really cracked me up. Because if you remember how it begins is with a woman throwing stuff out of a balcony, yelling at someone. This story felt to me a lot like the other book. You know what I'm saying? It was it was much more lighthearted and much more fun than the other two stories. Yeah. Do, would you agree with that? Yeah, I actually, I was, I thought that the last story, you know, the Shard of Ice was so kind of sad that I was glad to get some funny stuff, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, me too. Because when I was reading, I was like, man, this, this has such a different tone than the last book. I liked it. But it just was was very, very different than what I was used to from the, the last stories, because the last stories had so much of the the fairy tale stuff and everything like that, that they just seemed like there was a lot more. It was a, a lot more lighthearted yeah. than these first two stories. But then when we get into this one where it's basically, uh, you know, it, it almost seems like Geralt's kind of along for the ride on this story. You know, yeah, he's he he's more of a background character, and, and I, I enjoyed this story a lot. It's one of my favorites in the entire book. Yeah, I thought it was a lot of fun, and I was going to, like, as I was reading the story, like, physically holding the book, um, the page that sets it up where a woman saying, You pig! You plague-stricken warbler! You trickster! And throwing... <laughs> Did you call him a pheasant? Yeah, and Geralt's just like, he's interested in what the hell is going on. He's just kind of riding around on his horse. And a large jar of cherry preserves. Uh, the Witcher's heard that before because Yennefer has been known to throw preserves at him. <laughs> yeah, and what I, lo I love how it's like, she there were preserves that she got for payment because there's no way she could make preserves. Yeah. And it even says, a slim man in a plum bonnet with a white feather jumped aside like a scalded cat. Please, Vespula, don't lend credence to the gossip. I was faithful to you. May I perish if it is not true. You bastard, you son of a devil, you wretch, the plump blonde yelled and went back into her house, no doubt in search of further missiles. So then I turn the page and I'm just like, oh, this is interesting. And the first words are, Hey, Dandelion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's perfectly set up, right? Yeah, I love that, that it was actually Dandelion who was being having all this stuff thrown at, and uh, he's in the street pleading with her. I thought that was so funny, and I was like, oh, that Dandelion. <laughs> yeah, weren't you commenting like you were wondering how they actually did that in the publication? <laughs> yeah, because it was just like perfect, is hey, Dandelion, and I laughed out loud. I was like, of course it's Dandelion. Who that one's yeah. uh, mad at? Vespula. Oh, they keep referring to his hat as a bonnet. Is that the type of hat that you would, like, almost like a Peter Pan hat? I don't know. It's kind of like, uh, I'm trying to think. Is it like... Because uh, every time you hear bonnet, you think, like, you know, baby bonnet or whatever. Yeah, but I when you think about this hat with, like, a, with a, a big feather in it, you know, I kind of think, like, you know, one of those big, long, pointy minstrel hats. Yeah, I think it's more of like a, almost like a puffed up beret type of thing or something. Oh, okay. I guess. But uh, Dandelion, he wants to... Oh, there's also a great line in there where, you know, he's like, Geralt, what a wonderful, you know, this is a wonderful city. Let's go to a tavern and have a drink. And he's like, this is such a wonderful place. And at that point, Geralt says, maybe we should go this way because there's a woman defecating in front of them <laughs> in the street. <laughs> do you remember that? I was just like, oh my God. No, I had forgotten about that, but it, I, I do remember it now. Yeah, and uh, Dandelion said, uh, what about Yennefer? And he's like, she's gone. You know, he doesn't want to talk about that at all. He's just like, don't yeah. worry about it. So uh, they go to visit his... Fr oh, first of all, he tries to get them drinks, but the guy's like, no, no, no. You need to pay up, buddy, because apparently he has quite a tab. There. He has a tab, yeah. So uh, Dandelion's like, hey, maybe I know somebody here. They will get us some booze. And he finds Dieter, uh, Dainty Biebervelt. That's the name. Dainty Biebervelt. Who's yeah, I love Dainty Biebervelt. 
But when they walk in, uh, Dainty has a look of terror on his face, and Dandelion's like, have you gone stupid? Why do you have that look on your face? And he's just like, uh, no reason. (laughs) (laughs) And he shares some, like, delicious onion soup with them, which sounds delicious, doesn't it? It did, yeah. It was definitely, uh, it sounded like a pretty good meal. So they're having... In uh, In terms of the hierarchy of meals, it comes in second to the one that he had with three jackdaws, but I think they're yeah. still eating pretty good. Yeah, three jackdaws was a much better, like, stew and stuff. Uh, exactly. So they're having a nice conversation with Dainty when, after a few moments, the door kicks in, and then there's another Dainty there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he's like... Uh, Imposter! <laughs> you know, he's... So, so when the when the first dainty was scared, do you think that was because it was uh, it was uh, Dudu being worried about seeing Geralt because he knew that he would think of him as a monster? I think so. I think just any kind of creature who's been called a monster sees a witcher, they're scared. I yeah, I think that's what it was. The story is just so crazy. It's, yeah, it's a lot of fun though. It is. It's so much fun. They're fighting with uh, Dainty and uh, or the Dainty Imposter, and the way it described it is kind of like it looked like dough with like flour on it or something. Like, yeah, it looked to me like uh, he he was basically like a lump of dough or a lump of clay. Yeah, and it said he moved on all fours like a spider. Yeah, such a weird creature. Yeah, and uh, it's kind of like a um, sad history. They ca- they call him a Doppler, or he calls himself a Doppler. But uh, Geralt's like he's a changeling. He's he's a mimic, or yeah, he's a mimic, and he's like basically they've been hunted down throughout history, and they put them in clay pots and bake them till they're trapped. And they just die that way or something. It sounds really terrible. Yeah, it sounds horrible. Did you uh, did you get his full name? Yeah, it was like Teleco Lung Lung La Vincla Torta or something like that. But my yeah. friends call me Doo Doo. Yeah, Lung Lungrevink La Torte, or my friends call me Doo Doo. And I <laughs> yeah. was just like, oh man, I love this. His friends call. I him love Doo-Doo. that giant name though at the beginning, all distilled down to Doo Doo, which is <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But they said he looked like dough, like fermenting dough or something when he was all... And uh, Sounds Geralt, like a very, very disgusting creature. Yeah, and Geralt wraps a silver chain around him to keep him from transforming. And Dainty's upset because he bonked him over the head and stole his money. And he took stole his horses. And it turns out that Doodoo sold all of his horses. And immediately some money off of it and he immediately like invested all that money in other things and i love as uh dainty is listening to all the things that he invested in it sounds like all worthless stuff yeah he's freaking out that he just like bought, he's, he's like it's all shit he he bought like cod liver oil some beeswax some cochineal and he's just like, oh my god, oh, I'm ruined, I'm ruined. It's like part of partially rancid cod liver oil. <laughs> yeah. He's like, hey, I got a good deal on it. Yeah, I got a good deal on it. And I think another guy shows up. Right? Is it Chappelle? Who, yeah, Chappelle shows and, up, who's a, a town official, right? Yeah, and he owes taxes on all the profits he made or whatever. And he's like, oh god, I'm going to be thrown into <laughs> yeah. a dungeon. And the thing that's where he's like, wait, he, he made profits. He took my stuff and like did a better job at it than I did. Oh, and I also remember at one point, like they're like, you guys are making too much noise. You're going to attract attention. Have that thing turn into something normal looking. So they decide to have him turn back into dainty because all dwarves look the same, right? Are all half. <laughs> yes. Yeah, halflings look the same. Yeah. All halflings look the same. Nobody would be able to tell you're the same. So uh, as soon as he does transform, when there's like a commotion, he gets away. So he's like, oh, great. Now we'll never be able to find him. So it's like Geralt, Dandelion, and Dainty looking for this uh, Doppler who looks just like him. And that's when they encounter Chappelle. 
And uh, he basically says that the town is protected by this flame. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I was thinking that because that, 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 they initially encounter the guy who asks Dainty for tax. Yeah, for yeah, the yeah. taxes, right? That's a different character, I believe, isn't it? Oh, I think you you might be right. Was it because he he comes to find out that that uh, they there was a revolt somewhere and like uh, the 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 place that used to be in charge in the revolt they used to dye their um, their stuff with indigo. It was a red color or uh, indigo's blue, right? Yeah, uh, dye it, all of their clothes in indigo. And now that the new faction has taken over, they needed the cochineal. So. Dainty actually, or the fake Dainty actually made like a killing on the cochineal. Yeah, yeah. Every all the things he bought are actually genius, like to exactly make him rich. And there's this great part where uh, he goes to visit Vimy Vivaldi, his bank, his banker. Bank. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know what was awesome about that is like when when Geralt and Dandelion are there in the bank, uh, Dandelion's like gosh, I would have thought a bank would be much different than this. Like, he's so destitute and poor that he's like never even been inside of a bank. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is funny. And these little it, the book describes it as an it walks in, a this thing walks in that has a strange voice and it's dressed in a burlap sack and it turns out it's like a gnome or something. Because uh, Daniel's like, what the hell is that thing? And girl's like, oh, that's a gnome. It's like this tiny little creature is like, oh, he wants to order so and so and this. And Vimmy's like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, do that. They're like coming in and out of the room. It's really a funny scene. Yeah, I love uh, in these books when you get into like um, fantasy bureaucracy. You know, it, it, I, I, that's one of the things that I kind of dig how they um, how they portray that. Yeah, yeah, that is great. Basically, they find out where uh, Dainty is. The Dainty mimic doo doo, <laughs> and he's in. The well, yeah, they're they're there, like uh, you know, trying to explain everything that's going on. And as they do, people are running in trying to get prices from this Dainty because there's another Dainty out there who's like still making moves, you know. Yeah, yeah. Which I thought was kind of funny because it's like here the guy escapes, but instead of escaping to the woods or changing into somebody else, he's still trying to conduct business like it was before. Yeah, he's in the market, uh, you know, doing business. And what's funny is he's like really good at these business decisions. Oh, he's amazing. Yeah. He's, he's basically taking the best part of, of Dainty's brain and putting it to use with all this information that I'm not necessarily sure where he got it from. But, uh, yeah, he, he, he makes a bunch of incredible business choices. And I thought that was great, too, that um, when they sh- watched him transform back into Dainty, they're like, oh, my God, it's amazing. And, like, Geralt is trying to say, he is you. He's an exact copy of you. In fact, he knows your thoughts also. And Dainty's like, no way. And, like, sure enough, he does. Like, it's some crazy thing that they can just do yeah i thought that uh th- this thing like it, it kind of made me a little bit paranoid making me wonder if like that type of creature actually exists and then i can like trust the people that are around me are actually the people they say they are you know yeah. like if adam from the bay area is actually adam or if he's uh, you know he's a, a, a copy just starts acting a little bit different mm-hmm. i can see that what's funny is as i was reading it i was like this is a story about uh, having your identity stolen. That's what's <laughs> yeah, his identity theft. In 1992, this guy's a visionary. <laughs> yeah, this is identity theft. But really, it's so much more than that. Uh, the Eternal Flame is supposed to pr- protect the city from magic and stuff, but I think we all know it's just a big hoax, right? Yeah. This uh, Eternal Flame, like... I forget what they called them, but there was some kind of like society of the eternal flame or something that they're lit all throughout town, but they're not staying lit. And apparently these things like the beeswax and the, the cod liver oil and the string that all will all help keep it lit for, for eternity. <laughs> yeah. It, it produces a nice red flame that the, doesn't smell too bad and actually will stay lit. There's this great bit where they go to the market to find doo-doo and Vespula's in the crowd looking for 
uh, for Dandelion. And uh, Geralt's like trying to warn him not to go that way because he's singing for people. Uh-huh. He tracks down Dudu and he they chases him into a tent and he starts to transform into uh, Geralt. And he even has the sword and everything. But Geralt knows that he can't stay that way because when he reads him, he'll see there's nothing there or something. Yeah. I think it's interesting because he's saying, like, you know, you, you can't defeat me because I am you. But it's like when when Dainty or when he changed into Dainty, he took Dainty's best skill of being um, a businessman and just completely excelled at that. So I'm wondering if he would have done the same thing with Geralt and his ability as a fighter. Oh, yeah, because he says, you know, he's an exact copy of Geralt, but Geralt knew better that. He could not. He's like, all you, all you do is see the goodness, like, because you don't have the ability to see the bad. Right. Like you could have murdered dainty and, and assumed his form, but you, you couldn't do that because you're just a good natured Doppler whose friends call him doo doo. I thought yeah. that was pretty cool. He basically said like, if you would have just buried dainty and no one knew, uh, found his body, you could pull this off and no problem, but he didn't do that. And he basically couldn't become a witcher because uh, he wouldn't have anything to read off of, maybe? Well, he just, I just don't think he could relate to the, the darkness that's inside of Geralt. Or right. he wouldn't have the will to do the things that Geralt is willing to do. Yeah, and then he transforms into Dandelion. And he's like, well, I'll be leaving now, Geralt. See you later. <laughs> And Vespola cracks him in the head. Cracks him on the head with a frying pan. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Cling. And he rolls him up in a carpet, doesn't he? Yeah. Well, because he, he, what he uh, when he gets hit with the frying pan, he starts to kind of shift form. And he wants to hide the fact that he's a Doppler because he knows what's going to happen. Or yeah. Geralt wants to hide it. And so very quickly, he rolls him up in a carpet. Yeah, he doesn't want to. And it's like, ah, he's, he's sick. Everybody stay away. Yeah, and that's when Chappelle shows up, and Chappelle's like, "Ah, oh, nothing to see here." And they're and they realize that Chappelle is also a Doppler, and that the real Chappelle. You know what's funny is they even said that Chappelle hadn't been acting himself lately. Like, yeah, he'd been much more uh, generous and and nice basically than the old ones. He was absolutely ruthless, and he hadn't been acting that way, and he'd been he'd changed a lot. And so it turns out that he found Chappelle, who had health problems, dead. And so he essentially buried him and took over his identity. And they basically tell Geralt they will not go back to living in the forest, like in the wild. Like Dudu even says that he had to be a wolf in a pack. That's the only way he could survive for a while. And they're not going to go back to doing that. They're going to stay here. And uh, they all basically become friends, don't they? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Well, he tells him to change back into, or uh, Chappelle tells Dainty to, or uh, Doodoo to change back into Dainty, and he does. And then they, he basically assumes the identity of of Dainty's cousin, and now they're going to go into business together. Yeah, and like uh, Doodoo Bieberfeld. <laughs> exactly. And I, I like it because it seems like uh, Geralt, like. He, he identifies with these characters because they are they're you know sentient intelligent characters that don't fit in with like the human uh, element of this world and I yeah. think he feels a lot of the same way so he kind of feels a bit of a kinship with them yeah I love that there's even like a happy ending where they all go to the Passiflora together the oh, yeah exactly and he's like, well, well, what if they don't let halflings in? And he's like, oh, I'll have a word with them, you know, and they're going to let you in. Don't worry. I just thought it was a great wrap up. And it reminded me a lot of how Geralt, he had kind of whenever somebody doesn't quite fit into society, he can totally identify with it. Yeah, exactly. I, uh, this story felt to me like when you said it was something that was put in a magazine first, it really felt like a, a short story that you would find in a magazine that would like tr- is intended to draw you into the bigger series. Right. It def- that, that makes a whole lot more sense to me because it didn't necessarily feel like it fit 
within the entire book. Uh, it, yeah, it just yeah. seemed a little bit out of place with, with everything, all the heavy stuff that's going on. But then when you describe it as something that was put in a, that was in a magazine, that totally makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's definitely more comical. Well, it's like I said before, like Geralt's not even the main character of the story, really. You know, you He's know, just kind of a- there as an observer or as an observer what's really great about this story also is Geralt has just spent all of his money on a new jacket oh yeah that's there's awesome. a point where these <laughs> guys are like hey we got this is the guy and they're pulling on him and they rip his jacket and he's like oh damn it and he's even trying to fix his jacket throughout the story and there's even parts where they're talking and it says Geralt goes on tugging at his jacket trying to <laughs> yeah. it. Like he's just like listening, but he's also like, "Damn it, my jacket!" <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's his main concern in this story is his jacket, which is is awesome. It sounds to me like if you're gonna be a witcher, you need to buy a better jacket. Yeah. You know, so you got to invest a little bit more money in that. And remember, at the end, Chappelle's or they're like, "How can we repay you?" And he goes, "Well, enough money to buy a new jacket." <laughs> Which, yeah, good. 22 uh, marks. <laughs> yeah, and so that's what he gets out of it, which is hilarious. He's not greedy. He just wants his jacket. Exactly. Guy, the guy just came into 20,000 uh, you know, marks or whatever, and uh, all he needs is a jacket. Now, A Little Sacrifice is a very interesting story. It involves Geralt as a go-between between this guy and a mermaid as the story begins. And it's all about he's professing his love to this mermaid. And she's basically saying, well, if you love me, then come live in the ocean with me. And he's like, no, 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 no. You come live on land with me. Because, you know, he could find a nice sorcerer, would give her legs. And it's funny, there's a bit about... There's quite the description of her breasts, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. They were, like, perfect, but unfortunately they were green. Yeah, even Geralt's like, wow, you know, they're they're perfect, and he can't help but stare. And you could tell yeah. that Andre Sapkowski, he definitely likes the female forum, doesn't he? I, 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 I agree with you. Um, <laughs> did you, did you, when you were listening to, uh, or did you listen to this story? Uh, actually, I didn't. I didn't listen to this one. Okay, so in terms of the way that the um, that he portrayed the way the the mermaid was talking, he was basically singing, you know, the, her words. And so Geralt, when he was replying back to her, had to sing in this like very um, unmelodic tone. It's like exactly what you how you would think Geralt would sing. Uh, how was that written in the book? Was it was it uh, r- like written out phonetically to where it seemed like they were singing? Um, I don't remember. I'm going to look. But, uh, yeah, I thought it was great that he could, that Geralt can speak mermaid was hilarious. Yeah. I, this, this story seemed to me kind of like, uh, the, the one that had the, the, the connection to fairy tales, like a lot of the other stories did. Yeah. This one had that element in it, which I, I like cause I kind of missed that whole thing. I, I knew that it's not something that you could do for every story. It might get kind of tired and you'd run out of fairy tales that everybody was used to, especially in 1992, uh, you know, w- without all the Disney movies coming out. But it, um, I liked it. I thought it really fit in with the other, the other book as well. What's funny is it seems like later on Dandelion, he's like, I shall write a song about them. And that kind of sounds like the Little Mermaid, the story he's coming up with. (laughs) Exactly, yeah. He's like, oh, yeah, she'll lose her leg. Like, she'll get legs, but she'll lose her voice. You know, it'll be great. Yeah, let's see. In the text, he just basically, it's just a normal sentence, the way it's written. Okay, because the way that that, uh, Kenny does it is he kind of sings it. It's pretty cool. Oh, that's awesome. I'll have to listen to that. That's one thing that's interesting is because I've been listening to a podcast, a Witcher podcast, where they're still talking about the last wish. Like each episode, they talk about one story. And even Uh, though I I pass that up, you know, I'm in the second book. I still enjoy hearing them talking about those other stories. So I'll definitely go back and listen to the audio of, of this one. Yeah, it's definitely worth it. But this guy, Aglaval... Uh, that's uh, how I think his name is pronounced. He doesn't pay Geralt anything because the mermaid doesn't agree. <laughs> yeah, I'm just kind of wondering what the the mermaid sees in him because he just seems like a horrible person altogether. Yeah, he's an asshole, and he's <laughs> exactly. And what's funny is uh, 
uh, Dandelion's like, well, so you didn't get paid, and I don't have any money. How are we going to eat, Geralt? We're starving. We don't have any money for beer, you know? And then, luckily, a guy comes along. He's like, hey, we're having a wedding, and we could really use a bard over there. And we even have another one. And uh, he's like, wait, two? Like, I don't play somewhere where there's already another one, you know? I love how he <laughs> yeah. kind of acts like kind of insulted and Geralt's like dandelion we're starving and he's like, oh. <laughs> yeah exactly it's like a a matter of uh, professional pride for him yeah and he goes well who's the other bard and it's like it's Essie Davin and I- the funny thing was is is the way that uh that the narrator did this is his voice for this guy and the sheep bagger were exactly the same so in my mind i was kind of thinking they're the same person um even though they're completely <laughs> different but i was like oh man the guy's having a wedding now that's he's cool like, he really came up since he poisoned that dragon he's like oh are you <laughs> yeah yeah, I love this because they get invited to this thing, and sure enough, there's lots of food and booze, and uh, they're having a grand old time. And don't you love how it describes Dandelion, how he just plays it all up? Like, oh, me? Oh, you guys. You know, they're all like, yay, Dandelion. He's- yeah. Well, I love that we, we discussed this. He's like a, a total celebrity, but he's constantly broke. Yeah, he has no money. It's it's fantastic. I love his character. I love that him and Geralt are always hanging around. He's just got this Witcher with him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they they do not fit. Yeah, not at all. And I love the stuff with S.C. Davin where uh, they have this exchange where he kind of gives her shit about singing songs that aren't hers. And she kind of gives him shit about being old. And then they like embrace, like, oh, you, and they're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's like, he's like, uh, basically, he's like, yeah. Well, where I sing, you know, they don't like the type of songs that y- you do, and and she's like, yeah, I don't really have much experience singing in whorehouses, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> yeah, that was great. I was like, oh, I like her. You know, she's yeah, she was cool. Little Eye, as he called her, and immediately, you know, uh, Geralt notices her beautiful pair of eyes. And there's a quite a strange exchange with them where he kind of insults her kind of on accident, you know, he kind of says something ugly to her. I don't even yeah. know what it is, but she's kind of put off. And even Daniel is like, that was not necessary to talk to her that way. Cause you kind of figure out that uh, Dandelion kind of thinks of her as like a younger sister. Like, uh, he's not trying to sleep with her, actually. He, <laughs> think yeah, which is a shock. Yeah, yeah, because I thought, like, immediately that's what it, he was going to be into. But uh, as they're having this lovely wedding and stuff, this uh, gathering, Geralt kind of goes outside with her, and he kind of makes a move on her, which was really awesome. Yeah, that was a, that was a, a weird exchange, because it... it um... It, it, it seemed like she wanted him to, and she kissed him, but it also seemed like he didn't want... He did, it seemed like he felt compelled to do it for some reason. Yeah, and then, like, she pushes him away. She pushes her body away from him, and he's kind of like, oh, okay, I seem to have misread this situation. And, uh, okay. And so they... But back. she still kisses him, though. It's it's weird. She, like, pushes him away, but still lets him kiss her. Right. It's like she knew better kind of a thing. Yeah. And Dandelion knows something is up because she came in blushing back in from outside. And he's like, what's going on here? And he kind of yells at Geralt about it. Kind of like, uh, you know, what are your intentions with Essie? And uh, I thought that was interesting because he's protective of her, which I thought was sweet. You know, he's come a long way uh, since uh, staring at Yennefer's uh, breath. <laughs> yes, it's true. Like, it's the many faces of Dandelion. Yeah, you yeah. know, he's got so many different intricate, you know, things he does. So we hear He's about, blooming. Oh, yeah. That was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this bit where uh, out at the sea, these uh, men have been found murdered on a ship, right? Like their bodies have been cut up and nobody knows what's going on. And they want that same guy, Aglaval, he wants, you know, he'll pay Geralt. Well, he, sh- he shows up at the wedding and starts talking to uh, the the host of the, of the wedding because he's his main um, pearl guy, right? 
or so, something to that yeah, effect. Yeah. And so he shows up to the wedding and is basically like, all right, Witcher, why don't you solve this sea monster problem we have? Because that's what he thinks it is. Yeah, and I also I love that bit where uh, Geralt and uh, Dandelion are... He's like, you don't need to come with me, Dandelion. He's like, no, no, nonsense. I'll come with you. And they're looking around. He's looking at seashells and stuff. And yeah. Well, I love how Dandelion's like constantly looking for ballad material. You yeah. know? He's, he's like, like, it's so much better if you're there. It's like, if something happens, you know, I could have some material to write something. And uh, he basically, he encounters these sea men creatures uh frog yeah. dudes, fish guys something from well yeah they, they go down to the uh to the they, they figure out that they can instead of because nobody wants to ride on uh a boat out in there they're all freaked out and so they figure that if they can go out while the tide is out which is where we get that awesome exchange about the moon uh involving the tide or it being a monster yeah um they they figure that they can uh, just walk out to where the whole thing happened and see what's going on down there while the tide is out. And it's something that he figures out with Essie. And Essie seems to have a vast knowledge of the sea and that whole, like, um, world, which led me to believe that she was actually a mermaid, too. That's kind of where I thought the story was going. I was that waiting she was for ma- something like that. What's that? I was, uh, I was waiting for something like that. Exactly. I thought that she was going to turn out to be kind of the aerial character in this story, but we we really didn't get that. But I'm just going to pretend that that's what happened. Right. And uh, he encounters these fishmen. I'm not even sure what they are. They have gills and stuff and they have swords and they're, you know, they, you know, they fight with swords, which I thought was interesting. And Geralt's fighting them, but there's too many of them. Yeah, I, I thought that they were like heavily armed Dr. Zoidbergs. (laughs) <laughs> you know, that's kind of what I pictured in my mind, awesome. but um, I don't, I don't think that that's actually the case. I picture, I think cause Aquaman was on recently. I pictured something like that, like a crab dude or something. I don't know. Yeah. That's, that's way more intimidating than an army of heavily armed Dr. Zoidberg. Zoidberg. Yeah. Uh, so they're fighting it out. And by the way, they discovered their steps to an ancient underwater city, right? Called ease or something. Yeah, S. I think that that's the way they pronounced it in the book, I believe, or in the uh, was it called in the narration? E's or S? Some S, something like that. Here's what it was: Y apostrophe S. And I was like, now how the hell do I pronounce this? <laughs> really? That's. I mean, way to get creative, guys. Is it Y's, I's, E's? I don't know. So anyway, they find that place and. Uh, I think that's probably, uh, with him calling it S or whatever, uh, it's probably him taking liberties like he did with Dandelion. So it's probably pronounced the way that you said it, because your pronunciation skills, you're the, you're the go-to at this point. Well, I know there's a video game called Y apostrophe S, but they call it E's. So that's oh, really? why I thought that. Like maybe huh. it's based on some kind of lore and that's where they got it from. I don't know. But it's Sheenaz, the uh, mermaid, earlier told Geralt not to go anywhere over there. And so they go anyway, and he he is injured, and they take him back. And in fact, Essie Davin, she ran out there too because she was so concerned about him. And she tells Geralt that she is in love with him. She was in love with him from the moment she saw him. And he feels immediately like, is this what Yennefer feels like with me? Because I don't feel that way about her. And he feels like a total asshole, like immediately. <laughs> yeah, he does. And he's just like, uh, and that, and they kind of, are- which is so, it's, it's so weird. Cause it, it felt like he was the initiator when they had the kiss on the bridge, you know? But then when she reciprocates, he's, he's kind of like, yeah, I don't. I don't really want this. It, it, which it just made me kind of wonder why he did that on the bridge. Maybe yeah. it was because he was so lonely that he wasn't well, with Yennefer that he was um, trying to use her as a substitute. Maybe. Well, remember, like he accidentally insulted her, and then he went out there and he was like, "Hey, I just wanted to apologize." And then he's like, "Hey, uh, I guess we kiss here or something." Yeah, I was, I was gonna say I've insulted a lot of people, and it doesn't necessarily turn into a makeout session. <laughs> yeah. You know? Well, what's funny is, uh, you know, the th- 
he's talking he starts thinking in love it takes a little sacrifice and that's what Sheenaz says that Aglaval won't make a sacrifice for her like he even said I waited three hours she never showed up and he leaves and then she shows up and he's like yeah he just left he, you, you took too long and she's like oh just a little sacrifice he couldn't wait it a little bit longer you know and <laughs> yeah I love her her character too about like she's like you know it wants him to basically get rid of his legs and turn himself into a merman because he looks like a just a ridiculous like five pointed or four pointed starfish or something yeah. I like when he says, this is preposterous. Even if I did jump in the water for her, I couldn't breathe. And he's like, yeah, he can't breathe underwater. And she's like, that's just a formality. Yeah. (laughs) And so uh, that guy shows up and uh, Geralt's trying to tell him like, hey, they have numbers down there. There's like an army of these undersea creatures. You can never go down there. Because remember, they're they're like in the pearl diving business, aren't they? Uh, yeah, they, they make a lot of their money off of pearl diving and fishing. And they, they they basically, because there was that attack on the people from what they thought originally was a sea monster, and now we find out that it's an entire race of sea creatures that are sentient, like, uh, they people were afraid to go out on the ocean, so it stopped the flow of money and right. stopped the flow of pearls. Uh, and so that's why Aglaval is so intent on getting things going again. And I thought it was interesting that, uh, you know, when they get back in uh, Geralt's on the mend, um, Dandelion, he's like trying to shuck all the oysters to find something. And then when Essie shows up, he's just like, here, this is for you. It's for your birthday or whatever. And she's like, oh. And it's a shell with just like some disgusting smelling thing inside of it. Yeah. And she like cracks it open and there's a blue pearl inside. And uh, Geralt's like, this will bring you good luck. And she ha- they have it put into a necklace for her. Well, at that point, that's when she professes her undying love for him all of a sudden, yeah. out of nowhere. Dandelion says, when he hands the the oyster to her or whatever, he goes, this is from Geralt <laughs> as he leaves. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so she's like, is this really from you? And he's like, uh... Like, you remembered my birthday? And he's like, I don't even know you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know your birthday. <laughs> So uh, she has it made into this beautiful n- necklace, right? Yeah, well, she, she, like I said, she professes her undying love to him. And he's just like, I don't have, it, I can't give you what you're looking for, you know? And so instead of giving her what she's looking for, he gives her this like necklace that she says, is, that he says is like her talisman, kind of like his wolf necklace. And it will be there to protect her, you know? It, it, but like it, there was nothing really behind that because she loved him and he didn't love her at all. And he felt bad about it, yeah. but you know, it's just, he, he, it wasn't there for him. Yeah. And then this Aglaval guy talks to him about the threat down there. And he says, basically, basically they're going to go to war with them. They're going to be battling. They, they need that part of the ocean. And, you know, girl's trying to say like, this is going to take years. You don't want to do this. You should just give up and find a new line of work. And, uh, He's like, no, 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 we're never going to give up. This is what we're going to do. And it's just going to be lots of bloodshed and stuff. And then Sheenaz shows up and she has legs. Well, also b- before she shows up with the legs, that's when Essie really gives Aglaval, you know, the what for verbally. Like she basically says, you know, that you, uh, that, that the ocean is not for you. And that's where I was thinking the whole little mermaid thing was going to come in because, um, because uh, Sheenaz kept saying to Geralt, the ocean is not for you. It's not for you. It's like it's not your place. And then Essie says the same thing. So that's why I was thinking, oh, well, she's obviously Ariel. And then she- Sheenaz is the one that comes walking in right after that with the legs. And I was like, oh, man, I- I'm totally wrong. Yes, she decides to make a sacrifice. And do you have a feeling this whole thing, she realizes because of the skirmish and they know about those see people that she needs to do this to have some kind of say in what happens so there's not just outright bloodshed oh yeah well he when, when aglavel sees her he she he completely falls to his knees i think he's going to be putty in her hands and then in eventually a couple of years he's gonna uh you know mysteriously get food poisoning and then <laughs> yeah. you know she and as well and the and the merfolk will take over that town 
Yeah, and I love as Geralt, Dandelion, and Essie leave, um, they're like camping and they're going to go their separate ways the next day that basically Dandelion yells at both of them, like, just sleep together, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just do it. Come on. I'm going to it over for a with. while. When I come back, I want you to have to have slept together. And so- Yeah, well, it's funny the way they describe the trip because he, like, won't stop talking. He, like, he won't shut up, and they, they aren't saying anything because there's this weird tension between them. <laughs> and he's finally just like, will you guys do it already, please? Yeah, I love that. I just picture them riding it. They're just both, like, just quiet, not saying a word. They're just... <laughs> You know, we've been on car trips like that. Where two people are meeting yeah. each other in the car, and uh, he's just like never shuts up, just talking the entire way. And I love his like, "Would you guys? You're driving me crazy." Well, essentially, they do it, and uh, they hold each other. And it, I love this the way it kind of. Oh, that, that's what I'm sorry. That's what it is. He he explains to them like he basically breaks the whole thing down in that he he he's like, "Look, you want her." Or, or you want him, he can't give you what you want. And you just want her to basically go away and read your mind like the other one does, like Yennefer does. But that's not going to work. You have to talk to her about this. And so he actually kind of lays his feelings out to her, and then they end up doing it anyway and kind of going on their separate ways. Yeah, I love that after that um, dandelion sings to them into the night as they lie by the fire kind of cuddled up together. I thought it was kind of a sweet moment. And then it kind of ends on this really sad note. Where- oh man, the writing on that, like the, the writing of like the, probably the last couple pages of this, where it's talking about the song that he writes and everything like that is probably like my favorite writing in this whole book. Like that, that was, it was really beautiful. It was very beautiful. Well, you had even texted me about that at the end where, where there's the little line about the werewolf and you're like, this is just so, such good writing. And I was like, yeah, it, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty freaking awesome. Essentially you find out that years later, Essie died of smallpox and Dandelion was there and he took her out to, into the woods to bury her with her loot and her pearl necklace that she had. And it said Dandelion wrote this beautiful song about that, but he will never ever sing it for anyone. And it says right before dawn, while it was still dark, a hungry, vicious werewolf crept up to their camp, but saw that it was dandelion. So he listened for a moment and then went on his way. I thought that was hilarious. That was so cool. Yeah. Really cool. It was also like the, the whole part about her being buried with the pearl really got to me because it was like, he gave her this thing and was like, look, this, this will be, the thing that I have just for you, it will protect you. And then come to find out four years later, it didn't protect her. She died of the smallpox, but she still wanted to be buried with it. It, it was super meaningful. You know what I'm saying? Because that yeah. basically sums up her love for Geralt. Like, it's it's this thing that she ultimately wants and is, is like, looking at as the ultimate prize, but it's ultimately this something that's completely empty. And, and was, uh, you know, that was super touching. And the fact that Dandelion had he cared about her as like a little sister type of person. You know, he, it wasn't someone that he was out to sleep with and forget about it. She was a genuine friend that he cared about and that he was there in her moment of death. I thought it was really sad. Yeah. It was really beautiful. It was, uh, and for him to carry somebody who had smallpox, you know, he dandelion kind of comes out as the type of character that is looking out for himself, but to carry somebody and bury them who just died of an infectious disease, it really speaks to the depth of his character. Kind of like how I keep referring to that point where he sticks up for Geralt and doesn't abandon him when he's tied up with the the, uh, the elves in the first book. Yes. And then to start on the next story, I, you know, I, one thing I want to say, cause we're on a timetable. I don't want to give any of these short, these stories, the short shrift, but I did enjoy every single one of them. I just want to say that right now. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. But I have to say that so- Sword of Destiny is probably... that's It's such a good one. Am I right? Oh, yeah. So much to yeah. name the book after it. <laughs> well, yeah, th- there's, a, there's a definite shift after the mermaid story to where it, it gets into... Like, because the, the stories that were before were very good. And they were enjoyable, but it was it didn't really feed into like the meat of the overall story in my in my opinion, especially the one with dainty like 
that was a really cool glimpse into you know what Geralt does on his day off basically but like yeah. uh, these other ones were the reason why I think it, it became uh, my favorite of the two books right because Geralt is in Brokilon these massive woods of uh, that you're forbidden from going because you'll be killed, and I think it, it, the story starts off with he stumbles upon the body of a 15 year old boy who's been shot in the eye with an arrow, and he's you know what what I love is like in the Last Wish there are moments where Geralt plays detective where he's just kind of he's at a crime scene and he's putting pieces together you know I think it's interesting. I like when they do that. Duh. Yeah, he, well, that was the, the like my initial impression of him was that he was going to be well. You you said it before, like the Batman type investigator guy, and we don't really get a lot of that in this story except no. for this part. Yeah, and he remembers when in Brokilon they would give you maybe three warning shots before they kill you, but it looked like they only gave this boy one. Yeah, because yeah, not a lot of warning going on. There's with this one kid. arrow at the ground, and then second one was to the head, which is sad. And he's like wondering why, you know, who were these people and why were they here? Until he finds a, uh, I believe he gets shot at too, like an arrow whizzes by him and he ducks down. And he finds a guy who's still alive, kind of groaning, and it's his friend Frexinet. And he basically says that they were after the princess. They were trying to find the princess. She's lost in there. And uh, luckily... Well, the, the, the crazy thing is we find out that Frexinet is a baron. So they actually sent a baron out into the woods to go find her. Which you would think the baron would just send some people out there. But he actually went out himself. Yeah, this is like... Uh, they really messed up bad. Because basically, the queen sent her granddaughter to come visit and she ran away and uh you know they could come up with any reason to go to war like you killed my granddaughter we're going to war or something like that so like you need to get this girl back like immediately and so unfortunately she went into the brokalon forest where it's guarded by dryad warriors and now what's the difference between a dryad and an elf do you know uh, I think dryads are like, I thought of it as female druids in a way. They're like, they're people of the forest who worship nature. So they're human then. I think they're were once human, but they're transformed by the forest or something. Gotcha. Because I know that it seemed like the uh, the queen was was eternal, you know, like or, or she was um, uh, basically had the lifespan of an elf. But oh, yeah. um, I wasn't sure, like, what the difference was. Yeah. Uh, Lady Ithne, is that her name? Ithne? Ithne, yeah. Yeah, she's not messing around. She's very stuck to her principles. Uh, yeah, she definitely is. She's a bit of a zealot. Well, Geralt, luckily, he speaks Dryad, and he communicates, Hey, stop firing, uh, let me explain, or whatever. And uh, one girl, Brian, shows up with another one. And explains like who he is. He's the Witcher, as they call him. Oh man, what did they call him? They call him the White Wolf, but it's like Blade. Oh, uh, oh yeah. What was it? It was um, something. Blade. Uh, I, I, bl- uh, blind something. Yeah, I, I forget what it was. But basically, uh, they know him, so they know not to kill him. To, to take me to Lady Ifni. So uh, they send Brian with Geralt who they describe as very young. I think she's like a teenager, isn't she? Oh, they call him yeah. Gwineblade. Gwineblade, yeah, that's it. And uh, there's this cool action sequence where they find a little girl who is being attacked by a giant centipede, basically. That's where we get the names, the term Scalopendromorph, which is, you know, probably my favorite. You know, yeah. that and Zoig- Zoigl got to be my favorite uh, monster names. And I, I love, like, we keep reading that name several times until finally uh, it's described as a centipede. And I was like, oh, yeah, exactly. Like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> but it's cool because Brian with her uh, bow, she's like, I'm, you know, shooting different pieces and sticking it to a tree where it can't move until finally Geralt can uh, chop its head off. 
I don't think there would be anything more terrifying for me than to see a, a giant centipede. Like that. That's uh, yeah. That 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 was too much. Yeah, that's no. I wouldn't want to see that. But that's where we meet the character, the little girl named Siri, Princess Cirilla, and she immediately uh, is, I think, awesome. She's just hilarious the way she's ordering Geralt around. Yeah, she's very feisty. She's, uh, you know, got a lot of character, which is, you know, ultimately like, because at first I was thinking this relationship that they have between the two of them seems um, so different than what we're we're used to seeing Geralt have. You know, he's he's very uh, kind of tender with her, even though he's 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 teasing her a lot. Yeah, it was a, a like neat side of Geralt to see. Yeah, it was. I like their repartee, you know. Yeah. There's even a, a part where, you know, she says, uh, I'll, you know, we'll have your head chopped off if you treat me like that. And he's like, oh, that would hurt my feelings if you did that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know if you know this, but that hurts really bad. Something yeah. like that. There's no way that Geralt can just take Siri out of there because he doesn't know the way. And plus he describes that there's traps hidden. There's creatures there. So it's just too much. So he needs Brian to lead them to Lady Ithne into the heart of Brokelon. And there's even this great moment. I just love this where they have to camp for the night and Siri wants to hear a story. And he tells us oh, yeah. the fox and the cat, which I thought was great. And even the Brian, who was once a normal girl who has been transformed into a dryad. Basically, you find out that they drink this, the water of Brokelon, and it basically wipes your memory and you start over as a dryad is what it sounds like. Yeah. And he tells them this great story about the fox and the the cat and how the fox is like, when they come to hunt you, you know, you got to have all these moves and these different plans. And <laughs> yeah, he's got like 200 different things he can do to get away. And yeah. the cat's like, I just kind of got one. Yeah, I just climbed trees or whatever. And then eventually they show up the hunt and they get the fox immediately because they want to make muffs out of him. And Siri's like, yeah what's a muff? And he's like, don't interrupt me. And (laughs) the cat climbs the tree and they can't get to it. So they give up and the cat survives. And she's like, what's the moral to the story? And he's like, what? She's like, all, all good stories have morals. And he's like, uh, I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. And, uh, Brienne is like, um, yeah, you just got to do whatever you can to survive. Right. And so when they meet, uh, Ethne, Ethne, you know what they want to do is they want to take Siri and keep her. And Geralt knows that that's going to be a disaster if they do because there'll be a lot of explaining to do. Meanwhile, he doesn't know where Siri's from or who she is, but he does think there's something very familiar about her and her green eyes, right? He's like, Yeah. He's like, I know this person. Somehow. Yeah, it was basically like I've seen her before or I've seen whoever she came from before. Right. And at this point, I'm sitting there thinking like, oh, this is a good story. I wonder where this is going. I had like no idea that any <laughs> kind of connection. Yeah. Uh, did you have did you have an idea of the connection? Uh, yeah, pretty much. You did. OK, yeah, you're much smarter than I am. Well, it's not that it's just I I've known certain things like I just yeah, I, I figured it out, but it, it's just because of knowledge of the show and stuff like that. Gotcha. I figured out. Like, but at first, you don't know when you you're introduced to a character. You don't know it's going to be an S.E. Davin who lives and dies, and you never see again, or will show up again. But Siri, I'd heard that name before. I knew she was important to the story. Oh, okay, got you. And so I could pretty much figure out that it was very, she was someone important. And when I saw her name, I was like, oh my God, uh, this character who I've heard about is in here. So Geralt sees that uh, Frexinet is alive, that they actually brought him back. And I love the bit where Ithne's like, can you produce children? And he's like, well, yeah. And she's like, I'm not married. Yeah. He's like, I don't care about your marital status. So basically they need him to stick around a bit to uh, produce some children and then he can go. 
And he's like all for it. And Geralt's like, no, like, no, it's not going to be what you think it is. Yeah, it's not going to be like an orgy, dude. It's just like, it's, gonna be, <laughs> yeah. it's a business yeah. transaction, basically. Don't smile. Don't say anything unless you're spoken to first and et cetera. And uh, he tries to tell Lady Ifni that the kings actually sent him. That's why he's there, because, you know, please give a, you know, basically a king who wants peace he wants to be able to, for them to have a corner of Brokalon and let them have passage through it safely. And she's like, no, we can't have that. We'll fight for eternity for this. And I guess I can kind of see her point of view. If you think of it as kind of like uh, the Amazon rainforest, like everything else has been developed in the world around this forest. It's going to stay here. You're not touching it, you know? Yeah. Well, it's, it's funny because she's like, I, I already know what the the uh, message you're bringing me as an envoy is. And it's like, no, we, we've been fighting for this place for 200 years. We're not just going to give it over to you. Right. And she's also like, we're not giving uh, up this girl either. You know, the forest will have a say in that. And he's like, no, don't do this because you'll create war. And uh, she's like, what do I care about that? You know? That has nothing to do with me. And then there's basically a lot, you know, the book's called Sword of Destiny, and this has all to do with Geralt's belief in destiny. Uh, or, or lack thereof, really. Right. And even at one point, you know, Frexinet says, uh, calls Geralt Witcher, and, you know, Ceres, like, p- perks up. She goes, what? You're a Witcher? And he's like, yeah, didn't you know you were with a Witcher this entire time? She's like, no. And you have a feeling that she's heard a few things about a witcher throughout her life, right? And yeah. So- and you would think that I would have started to make the connection then, but nope, definitely didn't. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, then uh, Lady Ifni, she's like hell bent on, she's going to drink this water, dude, and we'll see what destiny has in store for her. And, you know, Geralt's like, no, no, I won't be privy to this. I don't want to watch her personality basically erased from her and she goes and uh siri's like no please stay and he's like okay i'll stay because she pleads with him and so she drinks it and she's like where will you go what do you want to stay here in brokalon she's like no i want to go with Geralt. and she's like well there we have it that's her destiny or whatever and girl's like say what now <laughs> yeah well he doesn't think it's actually the water of brokulon he's until like, he, is- she makes him try it this is some kind of elaborate trick you're playing on me. So he drinks it and he is like, well, what's funny is it never says he drinks it. He takes the cup. And I think it's interesting that Andre Sapkowski does this several times where they don't actually do the action. You just assume they do. And then like a vision happens, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's, yeah, I, I, I like that, but I also think that is kind of where a lot of my confusion when reading these books comes in because it happens so suddenly. Yes. It happened to me several times in the next story. Oh yeah, definitely. I I had to reread that story and go, Oh, Uh, okay. Okay. And I think a lot of it had to do with me being like, Oh dude, I got one more story. I'm reading this right now. and finishing this book. And kind of rushing through it. So then I took yeah. my time the second time. And I was like, so he sees a vision of Calanthe. Yeah, she's in armor. Like, uh, she's been stabbed, right? Right. And he figures out who Siri is. She's actually... Who is Siri, Jason? She's the daughter of wait what is what is her name i just had her pavetta name. yeah she's the daughter of pavetta Calanth- queen calanthe's daughters what remember at the end of that story Geralt was basically promised her yeah he was he was the the payment that he took for for breaking the curse okay. on uh what's his name uh Dooney. what was his name dooney 
Dooney, that's right. I wanted to call him Doo Doo, which he's really in like the you know really into names with the the Doo Doo. prefix. Um, So yeah, Doo Doo by the way. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that was a great name, right? Which I'm wondering like what that was in Polish, like if it if there was some other name for you know that. Uh, Anyway, yeah, like it turns out that uh, she's their daughter, and 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 I didn't really like. Until it actually, we saw that whole vision. I was, I, I, like I said, I was completely clueless. And then when it happened, I was like, oh my gosh, this book is amazing. I know. It's pretty awesome. When you realize who Siri is and why her ears perked up at the name Witcher, because you have to imagine her parents had basically told her her destiny lies with the Witcher her entire life. They weren't. Well, I. I, I wasn't thinking that that story, like that when we when we read it in the Last Wish, I thought it was a great story and it was really interesting. And I thought that that character, like that whole uh, plot about him and the child, was going to come up. But I didn't think it was going to be this big of a deal yeah. in the storyline. And then when you realize, no, it's Geralt's entire destiny. Like, that's crazy. It's like, dude, this is what it's all about, man. <laughs> and I, I really didn't think that these stories were going to go that direction. And I'm very, very happy that they are, you know? Right. Geralt and Siri wake up outside Brokilon, and he's going to lead her back to town. But she immediately has a sensation like she's like, we're going the wrong way. We shouldn't go this way. And Geralt's like, what are you talking about? We're close to the city. We're going to get a, a hot meal and probably take a bath because Geralt loves taking baths. And she's like, no, I don't think we should go this way. And he's like, you're silly. Come on, we're going this way. And immediately they run into a massacre scene of a bunch of people who have been killed with arrows. And there's a tree in the road and these soldiers from Verden who immediately seems suspicious, very suspect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I, that, I did pick up on that one. I'm not totally dense. When they said that there was a tree in the road that had been chopped down and they were like, it, it was dryads that did it, I was like, wait a minute, guys. Dryads wouldn't cut down that tree. There's something fishy going on yeah, here. Yeah, they established that dryads worship trees and they can control trees into growing them houses. They never chop wood. There's no way they do that. And Siri knows that too. I love how it keeps describing Geralt squeezes her hand for her not to say anything. She's like, wait a second. Dryads wouldn't do this. He's like, squeezing her hand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, they wouldn't chop down a tree. He's like, whoa, you're a smart one, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Did you listen? You listen to this one? Yeah. Where? Geralt, yeah, because there, there, there's the, uh, the, the stupid jerk's voice comes back in. I, and it's good. I fast forwarded to this part of the story and onto something more. So I just wanted to re-listen to this bit. And, uh, I love the part where, you know, it describes girl immediately starts looking at each man, judging distances and stuff. And he makes this, he, you know, they have archers there. They have dudes with crossbows. So they're kind of in a bad situation. And he tells Siri to run and she climbs up a tree and they even shoot at her, but miss Geralt, you know, flashes a sign at him and blows a bunch of dirt and pebbles in their faces. One thing I would say is if I had the ability to do those signs, like, wouldn't you just do those for everything? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's, oh, yeah, Jason, take the trash out. And you're just like, yeah. okay, I will. And just pile it up and do the sign of Ard, blow it up. But I love the, I guy, do that. the guy does the thing that I love where a bad guy goes, he's mine. Nobody. Yeah, anything. exactly. This one's mine. And you're like, oh, really now? You're going to take yeah. on Geralt of Rivia with a sword? And of course, you know, Geralt takes his ass out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that guy felt a lot like the other guy in the town who was working for the alderman. I forget his yeah. name. Uh, Sicarda. So he, they felt like they could have probably been brothers. Why well, notice there, they, the author makes note that Geralt, where he usually would have met his sword with his sword, he just lets him swing away and miss. Like, he wants him to overextend himself. So Geralt's not, like, par- parrying him with his blade. He's actually letting him swing and kind of moving out of the way so he can overextend, so he can get a move in. And I thought that was pretty cool. It kind of gives his train of thought in the fight. Yeah. Yeah. The fighting... Uh... 
he, he, like I said in the last book, the way he fights is just it's pretty is pretty neat. It's it's very fun to watch or uh, read. Yeah, and as soon as he takes that guy out, the other guy's going to open fire, but arrows start raining in from the from Brokalon and taking the guys out. And there's even this neat kind of illusion or something where the the path closes up with trees where the men have nowhere to go and they all get shot by arrows and taken down and he turns around and he sees Brian and he wishes her well, but he, he calls her by her name. Remember there's a one point where she gets confused and remember. Yeah. She says that her name's Mona. Yeah. She's like, actually my name's Mona. And I think he's like, Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, chill out. You're brands. Knock that shit off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mona. Who's Mona? But I love as the trees part and the the path is once again opened. You see a figure there that reveals himself to be Mouse Sack. Hey. Yay. Where you been, buddy? Yeah. Hey, Mouse Sack. I don't know what the deal is with your name, but hey, how's it going? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I love, I love Malsack. He's like, she's your destiny, Geralt, you know. And I love Geralt still in friggin' denial. Nah, actually, she's not, you know. Well, it's it's so funny because I never understood why he kept saying that he was never going to return to Sintra. And I didn't really realize that it was because he didn't want to involve the kid in, in his life. You know, it's basically him fleeing from destiny like he, he constantly has been. Right. He doesn't realize that that's the whole point, that she is your destiny. Well, he doesn't have a choice. He yeah. keeps saying, like, throughout the whole thing that, like, you know, destiny, it takes two parts, right? It takes the uh, the part of destiny, but it also takes the part of the person to choose it. And it really seems like he doesn't have a choice. Right. And I thought Brokilon, the whole kind of establishing that place and... Lady Ithne and stuff, I thought was really awesome. thought it was very cool. Oh, yeah. It was a really cool glimpse into that world. I just was thinking when they were, were kept making the, the distinction between elves and dryads, I was kind of confused as to what they were because they were calling them like eerie wives. Yeah, and I they guess them in, eerie wives, yeah. in, in their um, folklore or whatever, they're supposed to be these tiny little creatures, but it turns out they're just kind of humans changed a little bit i think they kind of established also that their numbers had dwindled where they started taking in orphans and people remember they said that they tried to kill us off by leaving children with smallpox smallpox yeah wondering knowing that we weren't immune or something they not only were they immune but they could cure the children they would become them also so the dryads maybe they were something more mystical back then, but now there are humans transformed into dryads. I think they're basically yeah. just erases their memory and they become part of their tribe. Well, and I, I think that's neat that in, in uh, this whole world, you can start out as a human and then become something else. Kind of like Geralt was like, now he is considered to be a mutant because you know, he's no longer human because of the uh, the trial of the grasses or whatever. Yeah, and his I guess he his cat eyes kind of freak people out sometimes. Yeah, that is true. And sometimes I forget about that, but it says he turns his pupils into slits when the, there's low light or something. Yeah, I wanted to be that guy who gets those sweet cat eye contacts <laughs> and wears those around, you know. But. Oh, it's like Geralt of Rivia. <laughs> you must be a Witcher fan. Yeah, that guy's a huge Witcher fan. But it's heartbreaking when Siri falls asleep. She's cuddling with Geralt as they're sitting in a campfire. And he's like, basically tells Mas- Malsack that, you know, Malsack says that I'm supposed to return her to her grandmother. And, but you could always take her and I would explain and I would, you know, pay the consequences. And girl's like, no, I'm not taking her. You need to take her home. And he's like, what? It's your destiny. And he's like, no. he's like I don't believe in destiny. And it's really sad to find out that Pavetta and Dooney died at sea. I know. I liked them. I thought they were going to have a great future together. I know. And it's like their ship was never found. It's pretty mysterious there, man. Is it? Yeah, and in my in my head, I'm like, wait, this is a lot like Frozen, and then thinking like, well, this came out like 30 years after Frozen, so, or they're before Frozen, so never mind. That's a dumb idea. <laughs> but I mean, when you're lost at sea, it doesn't mean a body's been found. 
That's right. true. You're right. That's true. That's what I'm like. Ooh. Wait, do you know something that no, I don't know? I, honestly, I don't. I swear to God, I don't know. You've something. gleaned all this from that one two-minute trailer. Well, I just knew there was a little blonde girl involved. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> the best thing about the way the story ends, and the saddest thing, is when Geralt rides away. Siri's asleep, but she wakes up and starts yelling, Don't leave me! Geralt, come back! I am your yeah. destiny! <laughs> it reminded me of, like, in Big Daddy, where he's like, I can wipe my own ass! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It was like yeah. the Western. I thought of the Western Shane or whatever. Shane. Oh, okay, yeah, you're right. That, that's uh, that's much better than mine. <laughs> that is hilarious, though. <laughs> now, yeah. The final story, something more. I thought was the best in the book. I mean, oh yeah, definitely. I, I'm going to say in uh, emotion wise. Because- yeah, in terms of structure, it was a little confusing, like we had kind of talked about before. But yeah, uh, yeah. emotion-wise, this this one killed me. This one has such great payoff for the whole book. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, it starts out with a guy who's stuck with his, uh, uh, his wagon on a bridge. Underneath the bridge is a bunch of skeletons, skeletal remains. So you could say whatever lurks under there uh, tends to feed on a lot of people. And the guy is stuck there because he's apparently got the the biggest haul of his life and whatever business he's in that he's not willing to leave his wagon behind because he said it's basically a year's worth of riches. Like he's like, this is, you know, more money than I can ever hope to have. I'm not going to leave it here. Yeah, he'll be completely ruined. Right. So but his two men that were with him <coughs> ran away in fear. And he, the story begins with him hearing a horse come up, and he's scared, and he hides, and it's the voice of the Witcher, you know, you know, and he sees him, and it's Geralt of Rivia, and he's like, "Come on, you got to get out of here!" And of course, the guy's like, "No way, I'm not going anywhere." And he's like, uh, "Well, I can help you uh, for a price." And the guy's like, I will pay you whatever you want. <laughs> oh, no. And it's like, my, okay, sir. Well, you know, you just invoked the law of surprise. surprise. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was great. I was like, uh-oh, we got the law of surprise going on here. And there was a cool fight. They never say what these creatures are, do they? No, I didn't. I, I wasn't sure. At first, I thought it was like the skeletal remains coming back to life. Um, but yeah, I, I was thinking this bridge would do well to have a troll, you know, under it that that uh, is fixing it and guarding it. But what, apparently, this one is, didn't have it. Whatever it is, they are, they're super quick. They have razor sharp claws and teeth, and they're in numbers, so it's pretty scary. There's more than one of them. And Geralt, he, he's fighting them off with his. I like how it describes like just like the. He can hear the blade as it's going, you know, just slicing and dicing him up. But Geralt gets cut really bad in his leg. And he even comes up and the guy's like, I think even Geralt says, hey. And he turns around, he's like, oh, you know, like he's still alive. Like, and they're gone. The creatures are dead, but he immediately collapses. And was it? Did they cut him or was he bitten? I wasn't quite sure what, what happened there. I think it was a, a bite. Because I believe later on you hear that bites are especially bad oh, okay. because of all the bacteria and stuff that they carry. And the reason this story is interesting and kind of confusing at first is because it deals with Geralt going in and out of consciousness or in and out of past memories. And I'm not ever sure exactly when it's starting. Well, it says that like when he uh, gets attacked... He asks the guy to basically shove a bunch of pills and elixirs in his mouth that are like hallucinogens. So I was thinking that maybe the the visions were products of those. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Like he pours one on his leg. He's like, like, (laughs) pretty bad. And uh, he takes a hallucinogen. And he remembers, I think is the first one he remembers returning to Sintra. Yeah. 
And apparently he was there to meet uh, Kalanthi. And Mausak even tells him, you know, at one time, she sent me to kill you. And he's like, oh, really? And I was going to do it, too, because I do as I command. But she called it off. And he's just like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> you know, like, Kalanthi was like, you need to kill Geralt. And he's like, okay. And Good I luck, think, buddy. I think it's uh, interesting that he said he was going to do it. Or he, at least he was going to try to do it. Because he, you know, that's what she said. But... Luckily, she thought better of it. Yeah, originally I thought that she had he ordered Malsak to kill Siri, and I was like, "Well, that doesn't make any sense. That's not something a good grandma would do." And then I, on the second listen, I was like, "Oh, it's it's Carol." <laughs> kind of changed the uh, my opinion of her. What's interesting? What is interesting is also you uh, at this point, Geralt has no idea. He thinks that they have a boy. He assumes it's a boy. We see some children playing, and uh, she's kind of being difficult with them about it. And they have great conversations. I, I like that the whole conversation that they have with each other, talking about destiny. And he essentially says, I don't believe in destiny, and I don't want to take the child. And she's like, huh? Like, she can't believe it, because she was ready. She said, we'll play a game. You go down there, and you'll pick... And I'll see if you choose the right one. He's like, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of reminded me of when the, uh, the, the Diovel w- wanted him to, um, you know, do the riddle. And he's like, I'm not doing a riddle. And he like asks yeah. him the riddle anyway. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, he's not going to play that. And, uh, I thought that that whole, uh, conversation he has with her and, there's even one point he really pisses her off and he decides I should just nod instead of do- saying anything. And she's like, oh, well, I see that you've, uh, you know, got, you know, you're, you've smartened up there and you know not to say anything. <laughs> yeah. And he, she basically, she even says like, if I met you when I was much younger, she basically would have had an affair with him is what she's saying. <laughs> Doesn't it sound like that? Like, yeah, it seems like it. It seems like, um, it, it, it seems like strong, confident women are, are very attracted to him. And she asks him about uh, the law of surprise. And she said, you being a child of surprise. And he goes, well, actually, Mousette got that wrong. He assumed that. But uh, my mother was a sorceress and she gave me up to the witchers, which I thought was very interesting. And then when, when he wakes up, Nick, oh, well, he decides that he won't return to Sintra. He's not going to ever take the child is what that scene is all about. So the he uh, wakes well, up. Yeah, because he says to her, he's, he, she's kind of like, well, why are you here then six years later? And he's like, well, I just kind of wanted to stare destiny in the face. So it, it's very strange that he has no intention of bringing or, or taking the child, but he still shows up at the exact appointed time. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And uh, when he wakes up, he's being healed by a, a sorceress. And that sorceress you figure out is his mother. Yeah, that was crazy. I was thinking that that was part of the hallucination, but it, it turns out that that actually happened. And that was, um, I don't know, it was sad. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it was. Vicenna. And she sh- appeared very young because they can make themselves look young. And he's always wanted to ask her this question. And he's not asking it. And, you know, he's in a lot of pain and stuff, but... He's like, tomorrow when I wake up, I'm going to ask you this. And she's like, I'm not going to be here. <laughs> I'm out, buddy. And, yeah. And she says that when you wake up, you will know you won't remember this. You know, you won't have the feeling to ask this anymore. And he's like, wait, wait. And she's like, basically, I, I think she's soothing him with some kind of spell or something. Because he is, she knocks him out. Like, he, he falls unconscious. And I think it's very very cool the way she describes that Yurga, whose life he saved, he is, uh, does not want the, the Witcher to die. Like, he feels he owes him everything. And uh-huh. he's not gonna let him die. And, uh, she said that he owes you, and he'll rub the stuff on your back twice a day, trust me, because that's, he feels that he owes you. And when he wakes up again, the woman is gone, and Yurga kind of says that, you know, 
there was so much, you know, crackling of magics and light and stuff that we all hid in the woods until she was done because it was scaring us because she was uh, trying to keep him alive and heal him. Yeah, he, she worked so hard at, uh, at keeping alive that she got a nosebleed. Yeah, and she was pale and weakened, but before she left, she refused to take any payment, and she even healed one, uh, one of their guy's hands that was crushed by a log. And she even says to him, before he figures out that it's his mother, Vicenna, that... Well, and, and, and uh, the the cart, or the guy with the cart, what's his name again? Yurga. Yurga, that's right. Uh, he, he basically says to... Um, Geralt, yeah, like, man, she was really going all out for you, treating you kind of like, and then Geralt was like, what, like a mother? Yeah, that was good stuff. And um, she also, he says, at one point, he goes, Geralt, by the way, is the name given to me by this man, a witcher and whatever. And she goes, actually, you're wrong. That's not where you got your name. So he's like, she basically told him that I named you. So... I don't know. I care what that guy said. That I'm the one who named you Geralt. Your cool name. So <laughs> exactly. So on the way back home, uh, that's where they're riding. Yurga's home. They stop by this obelisk thing. It's like a memorial to fallen uh, sorcerers. Where uh, this great battle happened when the Nilfgaard invaded. And there's this really cool scene where Geralt walks up there and he's looking at the names and this woman shows up and it turns out to be death and talk. Yeah. I, I didn't pick up on that at first. I thought it was his mom again. And I was like, well, oh, they're going to get like some touching reunion. And then, I, you know, then it, it dawned on me that it was death. Yeah. What's been nipping at his heels all along, but he never turned around to look and then he admits I didn't turn around to look because I was afraid but you know what I'm not afraid anymore and she's like if you're not afraid anymore what's the final name on the memorial and he says it's Yennefer and when he wakes up he asks the guy what the final name is and it's not Yennefer at all it's just like some random dude right when he sees that when he thinks Yennefer is dead on that memorial he says you can take me now to death and she's like it's not your time he's like, yeah well I think uh, what what I liked was the way she described death uh, he was basically thinking that it was going to be some sort of very violent thing and she was like no I just my job is just to take people by the hand yeah and lead you through the mist and he th- He's like, yeah, you know, if you're, you can kill me now. And she's like, that's not what I do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, at your time of death, I lead you. Here's the part that confused me. It went right from that scene to uh, Yurga telling uh, Geralt that actually, you know, my wife hasn't been able to have children for some time, but I do have two sons. So if you want to take one of my sons as a witcher, you can. And uh, Geralt's like, why? Because that would be a great life for him. She's, he's like, well, it's a trade, you know, and he is training and he's a strong lad. And Geralt's I'm just like, trying to think of like what my wife's response would be if I was just like, oh, yeah, we um, we gave one of our kids away <laughs> yeah, he's to gonna go this guy. Monster. Yeah, this It's going to be good for him. I promise. I mean, I don't know him very well because most of the time we've known each other. He's been hallucinating, but he's going to go with him now. Yeah, and he, you know he's he, he's got some scary swords and stuff, and he he, well, he seems like a really great guy. He helped me with my card. <laughs> what confused me there is then he remembers like the same river when uh, there were people clamoring and they were yelling and they're crossing the river, and he saw a dandelion <laughs> left behind in a wagon with chickens, and he was calling to him, and the Nilfgaard were invading and. They were trying to get away, and he's like, uh, well, Dandelion, you need to go this way or whatever. And he's like, where are you going? And he's like, I'm going to Sintra. And he's like, Sintra's not there anymore. Oh, and I can't believe I forgot about the first part. When he first starts hallucinating, he uh, remembers being at this festival and meeting. Oh, that's Yennefer. right, a Beltane. That's right, I forgot yeah, about that, Beltane, too. Beltane, where everyone just basically has sex in the night and celebrates. With and strangers, right? It's yeah, supposed to strangers. be, like, unattached. 
and he finds Yennefer there. And I believe it's the last time he's seen Yennefer and they're cuddling and stuff. She's like, no, this isn't going to happen. And I don't know if anything does happen where uh, she ends their conversation with, you must go to Sintra go to Sintra and uh, yeah that was crazy that she that she actually was the one who told him to go do it yeah and he said how do you know about that she goes I know everything about you Geralt and so well it makes me it makes me wonder like what uh what her reaction is going to be to him taking you know um or well we'll get to that oh I, I don't know I spoil know. it I know I know I'm believe me I'm thinking the same things so cut to now he's on his way to center so i'm thinking this happened right after that conversation with yennefer like cut to he started traveling towards centra and once he gets there the nilfgaard is invaded and they've sacked centra lady calanthe is dead she fought valiantly a lot of the royal family have killed themselves they killed the children the men killed the women and then the men fell on their swords it sounds terrible by the way and then- yeah it does Geralt's like, but uh, but um, Calanthe, they said she fought like incredibly valiantly and like held them off, you know. Yeah, and Geralt wants to know about the little girl Siri, and uh, Dandelion can't tell me anything, but he assumes she's dead, like all the other children. And he's like, "Where are you going now?" And he goes, "Come on, Dandelion." And I love that there's this line, and I don't know why I got very emotionally touched. Dandelion's freaking out. He goes, I can't believe you're going to leave me here all alone. Uh, you know, I'll be killed. And he's like, Dandelion, you must be you know, fraught with fear and out of your mind. But I would never leave you here. And he picks him up and pulls him up on his horse. And I was just like, that's so sweet. You know, it's just funny. <laughs> yeah. He's not going to leave Dandelion behind. You can't leave Dandelion. Who's going to make Mary? <laughs> and so when they arrive to... Yurga's home. There's his wife. She's so happy to see him. And she uh, says the boys are out and the three of them will be back in a moment. And he's like, three of them? What are you talking about? She's like, oh, I guess I should tell you this. After the war and, you know, there were children. They were, you know, I I took a girl in. I hope you don't mind. And he's like, I've always wanted a daughter. He's like, Gads, something that surprised me when I got home. And he realizes, yeah. holy crap. And she's like, who's that man? And it's Geralt. And I love how it says Geralt is pretending to mess with his horse, but he's actually... Yeah, he, he knows what's happening. And all of a sudden you hear Siri go, Geralt! And he turns around and they start running towards each other. That killed me. Oh, like that, that whole... It was just such a great payoff to the entire book. It is. And she's like, see, I told you it was destiny, that I'm your destiny. And he says, you are, and you're so much more. And that ends with them. And you see the the wife is crying, and they've got he's got his boys and his wife in his arms, and they're watching as Geralt and Siri are embracing. I was like, man, what an ending. Yeah, gosh. It, probably one of the best endings to a, a series of books that I've I've ever read. I uh that just I I was not expecting this story to go not this story but this entire series to go this direction. And for me being like a dad of kids and yeah. having the story kind of being around finding meaning in your life through raising children. Like that's just like right up my alley. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So yeah. it, it's just uh, because I, I've always thought that this book was um, was all about some guy who was kind of wandering. He's very talented, kind of wandering, figuring out what the heck he's doing with his life. And he tried doing it with love with Yennefer, and that's not working out. He tried doing it with his profession, and th- th- it's not really needed so much anymore. And to find his meaning in life through raising and, and um, being the guardian for this young, vulnerable kid, like that made me cry, man. And I don't usually cry in books like this at I all. That, that was yeah. I just wasn't expecting that at all. I cheered up and I immediately uh, remember I texted you and I said that, uh, but I am confused about some things. And so I went back and reread it and I was like, Oh, okay. And uh, 
I got all emotional again, and then I listened to the audio. Oh, man. To hear that. And it's so good. It's such a good ending. And I immediately was like, I can't wait till Siri meets Dandelion, and then they hook up with Yennefer, and Yennefer sees... Well, that- that's what I'm wondering is, are they going to be like, is she going to fulfill that need for Yennefer and they're going to be one big happy family and nothing ever goes wrong again? <laughs> or like, you know, like I, I'm, I'm very curious to find out what that relationship is going to be like. Well, we have five books to read. So I'm thinking everything goes great. <laughs> very true. <laughs> Not everything's going to go fantastic, but man, I just like, it's a perfect. Setup. I hope it does though. You know, it's just like, they're happy. It's like nothing really wrong goes on. The fact you know, that Ger- have, Geralt's happy. We now have our first novel to read, Blood of Elves. I'm so excited. I am too. I'm, I'm really interested in the structure, like how it's going to differ from these, because these didn't feel like really a collection of short stories. It definitely felt like it had a, 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 a narrative running through. And maybe it's because we had all this stuff at the... Uh, at the Temple of Melitola in the last book. And in yeah. this book, um, you know, it, it seemed kind of like it was following somewhat of a timeline, mm-hmm. but I, I am very interested to see how it's going to be different in the novels. Me too. I'm definitely excited. And uh, thank you so much for reading these books along with me. I think it's cool that uh, we're sharing this together because I love texting you after I've read something or whatever. Oh yeah. Well, it's, it's so hard to, cause it's like, I want to talk about it, but I'm like, Oh, well, we'll talk about it on the show, but I want to talk about it now. And so I try talking about it with like people who haven't read the book or Adam, who's like way behind. And it's like, <laughs> ah, this isn't the same. Or this, like is, Steve this is so empty talking to you, Steven. Uh, yeah. Steven's still halfway through the first book. And, How's it going to feel now? It's like, dude, we're on book three, man. What the hell? (laughs) I think you should tell him that the next book in the Witcher series was written by Stephen King, and then he'll read it. You know, actually, uh, the gunslinger shows up halfway through the book. It's pretty cool. (laughs) What? Oh man, I'm going to speed read through this shit. But I guess I should wrap it up now because it's so funny. These shows take uh, a while for us to do, but I always have to go pick up my daughter. (laughs) Like, yeah, exactly. Right. right Understand, but. Ross, thank you so much for joining me for the second book show. I'm, awesome. Thank you for having me again. I, I am very much enjoying this series, and I'm very happy that you're having me along for the ride. I love it. And uh, it feels like you know we're sharing something, our enthusiasm for these books. I hope the next one's awesome. I'm, I'm in love with these characters already. You know, I care about I am, too. I, I, I'm, I, it's just I'm very fascinated to see what this whole relationship between Yennefer and Suri and Geralt, how that unit works together. And then yes. old uncle dandelion in the background. It's, it's uh, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. Uncle dandelion. I love it. I can't wait. That's what, when I crank this episode out and put it out and it's finally published on the feed, you, you can guarantee you like cracking the book open right after. Yeah, exactly. After we're done, I'm, done talking to you i'm probably going to start listening to the next one that's awesome because i miss the magic when the book's over i'm like oh yeah oh we gotta wait now okay but the funny thing is also i know you got a dash but i i um was kind of i want i like to listen to him twice and i was listening to the uh the through my second read through but i was running out of time so i was listening it on like times two speed and it just it it doesn't uh doesn't have the same magic oh i bet it sounds weird but it was very weird dude, also i want to know more about these Nilfgaard guys they sound like assholes <laughs> they do yeah it, i like um it, it sounds to me since the obelisk was erected that they won that whole thing but i was thinking the whole Nilfgaard war or whatever was going to be part of the war of elves so you know like i said i i'm a little bit uh very, very curious to see where this whole thing goes. Anybody who's listening, if you guys want to chime in, just send a voicemail to nimpodcast at gmail.com and we'll play it here on the podcast and we'll know what you guys have to say. Like if the books are for 12 year olds or anything like that. <laughs> I was wondering when that was going to come up. I almost forgot to mention it. <laughs> That's awesome. Right, yeah, I was I was rereading that part where at the end of the um, uh, of the mermaid story where uh, uh, Little Eye dies, and I was like, yeah, not not quite a twelve year old book. 
<laughs> yeah, not not for twelve year olds as they go to sleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. If I read this to my ten year old, he'd be like, "What is that? What smallpox?" Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't, you don't need to exactly. know that. I, I don't know why this came up in the book. I'm pretty pissed right now. I, <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is inappropriate. <laughs> All right, Ross. I will see you on the next show for Blood of Elves. I can't wait, Jason. Thanks for having me. You know it, man. I'll see you guys next time.